Good God, you outdid yourselves. I'm beyond impressed. As the episode begins, we get a montage of quotes from characters that allude to a certain Danny becoming a certain baddie. Every time a Targaryen is born, the gods flip a coin. The Mad King gave his enemies the justice he thought they deserved. Targaryen, alone in the world. It's a terrible thing. You don't want to wake the dragon. Children are not their father. Be a dragon. This is called subtlety, and it means the writers are concerned that the audience won't believe an upcoming event in the show, and so they collected any and all statements that could specifically support said event throughout the series and wedged it all into a montage, pre-game, in the hopes that anyone who thought Daenerys wouldn't kill scores of children might be convinced otherwise. And did it work? <laughs> we open on good old Varys taking action since we last saw him, fueled by his apprehension of Queen Daenerys, and it comes in the form of writing letters to other people in the kingdoms, letting them know that another Targaryen is alive and well and the heir to the throne. He is doing this in his dinky bedroom that's inside Danny's current castle. He's committing high treason with an unsullied being one curious knock away because that's of course what Varys would do. So he then hears footsteps. Knowing that anyone who sees the Raven Scroll could cost him his head, he places a blank page on top of it. <clears throat> I, um, you fucking what, mate? If I was an Unsullied and I knew this guy was in a recent significant disagreement with my queen and he is the master of whispers and he is writing letters that are covered when I enter the fucking room, you can bet your ass I'm gonna check them. Varus is supposed to be aware of these things. Motherfucker, sit on the letter, scribble over it, eat it for Christ's sake. Don't just put a piece of paper on top of it. How in the world is this character Varus? So, one of his little birds visits and she is dismayed to report that Daenerys isn't eating food food and Varus responds We'll try again at supper. Try again at supper. Right, so Varus is trying to poison Daenerys in an attempt to prevent her from hurting civilians in the potential sack of King's Landing. Which is curious. Why would Varus still be in this castle if he was attempting to murder the fucking queen of it? Why wouldn't he leave this place like he always has when his life is at risk and puppeteer from a distance? Especially when this woman has already threatened to kill him if he engages in betrayal. Also, why is he killing her now? Does he know what'll happen? The Sullied march home, or at the very least sail home, and they would likely have the Dothraki in tow, leaving Drogon no reason to hang around in the north. Dragons apparently don't do well there, as the show has already made clear. Meaning you have the Northmen and possibly Dawn versus King's Landing, the Golden Company, and the Iron Fleet, and that means Cersei wins, and the realm bleeds, because how in the world will he get Jon on the throne at that point? Does it make any sense that Varys, the spy master of Westeros, the guy who has more apparent history with monarchs than anyone alive would choose to kill Daenerys while Cersei is undefeated? No. Not to mention that his mistrust of her is based on the idea that Danny is willing to accept collateral damage, which is something Varys has always been on board with. He is the one that helped stoke the fires of this very war. He is the kind of person who would probably be 100% in line with Danny's plan on paper. I mean, I thought he was. So this can't be Varys. Don't believe me? Well, check out what happens next. I think they're watching me. Who? Her soldiers. Of course they are. That's their job. That's their job? You're telling me that it's not extremely concerning that your personal queen assassin is being watched by the men who fight for the queen, and the queen has stopped eating when your assassin's method of delivery was food? How is this not a series of huge red flags for you, Varys? Why are you not making arrangements to leave? What have I told you, Martha? The greater the risk, the greater the reward. What? The greater the risk, the greater the reward. How do you unironically say that when you're Varys? Did you learn nothing after what happened to Roz? Your entire thing is risk reduction to ensure that you can continue to influence the future. Nothing matters more than you being alive to serve the people of the realm. You do not engage with a plan if it entails a personal cost. Storms come and go. The big fish eat the little fish. And I keep on paddling. Oh, sorry, I played a clip of pre-season 6 Varys. Let's, uh, let's check out the new character they decided to shit onto our screens. I will act in their interest, no matter the personal cost. No matter the personal cost? That sounds pretty fucking heroic there, Varys. You watch my men being slaughtered and did nothing. And what again, my lord? When you look at me, do you see a hero? I saved your life. If they catch you, they catch me. 
I cannot say I feel overly guilty about leaving you in that fucking crate. Can you free me from this bed? I could. But will I? No. As I said, I'm no hero. <sighs> it would seem I'm playing clips from entirely different fucking shows at this point. It was me. I hope I deserve this. Truly, I do. You hope you deserve it? Who is this corpulent goblin and why do they insist on calling him Varys? How did this man manage to bend the ear of so many kings, allowing so many atrocities while living for so long if he's the jump on a grenade type? It's almost like all of this is happening so he can be unceremoniously flushed down the fucking toilet in a few minutes. Can you please do or say something intelligent? We then see John is giving us an update for his soldiers. They are at the Trident and they are moving to King's Landing which will take two days days. That's amusing, since Danny's forces managed to travel from Winterfell to the Euron battle, to Dragonstone on foot, to King's Landing on foot, and back to Dragonstone before Jon's could even get to the Trident. Don't bother questioning teleportation rules, it's never gonna make sense in-universe. Though in terms of writing, they are making the Northmen take this amount of time so that we can finish up the Varus story first, since if the attack had already begun, Varus wouldn't be able to hatch this tismy plot. Speaking of which, Varys decides he would like to speak to Jon about Danny's incoming decision to potentially murder hundreds of thousands for a fucking chair, and Jon seems to be on board with it. That's her decision to make, she is our queen. Fucking Neela. Varys then proceeds to tell Jon, someone he barely knows outside of him being honourable to his queen, that his queen is probably insane and they should unseat her from the throne. He deadass says this to Jon in front of a couple Northmen not metres away in full view of Tyrion Lannister, Hand of the Fucking Queen, the same guy who told you not two fucking days ago not to do anything. Varys is so fucking stupid at this point that I'm surprised he hasn't asked Daenerys personally if she would help him poison her. But the show isn't done ruining his character yet. He tells Jon that he is pretty sure his coin has landed well, meaning he is sane. That's interesting. Varys once thought that Daenerys' coin had landed well. He also once argued for Viserys' coin having landed well, despite agreeing later that it hadn't. Then we have the fact that he thought Robert, Joffrey, Stannis, Tommen and Cersei were all flawed rulers and they didn't have any fucking coin to begin with. So really the entire point of that saying is an excuse to make Targaryen characters randomly insane without having to write it in a way that makes any fucking sense, isn't it? It also tells us that Varys really had no fucking clue what he was doing this whole time. <sighs> what even made Varys think Danny was going to be a great queen in the first place? He seems to hate the idea of fire and blood when it comes to attaining victories. And what is my heart's desire? Vengeance. Justice. Fire and blood. Kind of forgot about... Oh. Well, fuck it. It's probably subjective or whatever. They say every time a Targaryen is born, the gods toss a coin and the world holds its breath. Not much for riddles where I'm from. John, a coin toss is not a riddle, you fucking beetroot. What do you want? All I've ever wanted. The right ruler on the Iron Throne. Uh-huh. Like I said, Varys is pretty fucking awful at this particular job, considering he's been doing this puppeteering for eight years now, having a hand in the death of rulers or the reputation of kings rising and falling, only to now meet some guy who has the right blood and say, yeah, this is the one. This is who it's all been for. It's almost like this makes no sense because they didn't keep all of the plot lines of the book, like young Griff, despite keeping the characters that were a part of them, and so Varys is akin to a headless fucking chicken in this show. I don't want it. I never have. John really showing off his incredible range of dialogue here. She is my queen. God fucking damn it, end me. When Varys said Danny was too strong for John, I was pissed off because it's a poor representation of John's character. But fuck it, I guess Varys was right. Tyrion then decides to talk to Daenerys, even though Varys says she won't see anyone. Makes me wonder if that statement was true or if people just haven't tried walking into a fucking room yet. Either way, she says someone has betrayed her and Tyrion waits for her to say, Jon Snow. And then this is his reaction. Varys. 
You witless gnome, how are you the hand of the queen and the smartest motherfucker in this world when you can't wait five fucking seconds to listen to what she is talking about before you throw Varus under the bus? Also, thanks for ratting him out. That was great to watch, considering how loyal and long-term his friendship has been. More on that in a second. What's bothering me right now is that we never find out if Tyrion is ratting out Varus for the poison, for the letters, for talking to John, or for the conversation they previously had. It's essentially impossible to tell by the dialogue. He simply says Varys betrayed you, but Danny also said that John has betrayed her, and the qualifier for this was John telling Sansa the secret. And so by that logic, would Tyrion not be a traitor at this point? And besides, in the scene it was discussed with John, it was never concluded as a promise or oath to never be told. She even specifies that she only begged him not to, and so him doing it now means betrayal? K. Okay. This then leads into Danny concluding that from Tyrion saying Varys has betrayed her, that Varys knows the truth about Jon, and that Tyrion must have told him, because Sansa must have told Tyrion, and thus Jon must have told Sansa. She figured this out in some kind of backward 40 chess moment when a shit ton of other things could have happened. But then this brings into question that if Varys' betrayal was news to Danny, then she can't know about the potential poisoning, and so why is she not eating food? Unless she assumes that every Everyone might be trying to poison her at this point, so she'll just eventually starve, I suppose. Maybe she's just not hungry to an insane degree, in which case Varys was just unlucky with his chosen method of assassination. What's disappointing is Danny doesn't even ask what Varys' betrayal is in this scene, she just accepts it. Was it the letters? The poison? Was it knowing and talking to John about his heritage? Are these things traitorous? Is she aware of all of them, or only some of them? What in the floppy fuck is happening? Why do you think Sansa told you? She trusts me. Yes, she trusted you to spread secrets that could destroy your own queen, and you did not let her down. So here we find out that Tyrion has been outsmarted by the snarky statue and the bleached baboon back to back, because Tyrion at this point really does have all of the intelligence of a chunky fart. He couldn't tell he was being manipulated by Sansa into screwing with Daenerys' rule when in the same scene the setup was that Sansa asked him if there was someone better who can rule, and Danny understood this without having heard what Sansa even said. And so, how does this character that the show calls Tyrion respond when faced with with this information. If I have failed you, my queen, forgive me. It actually upsets me to see Tyrion so fucking feeble-minded, submissive, and terrified when he was so much stronger when it came to rulers who were so much more threatening. We've had vicious kings, and we've had idiot kings, but I don't know if we've ever been cursed with a vicious idiot for a king. You can! I can, I am! I, Lancel Lannister, do solemnly oh, vow- Barret. Enough. Even torturing you is- Boring. Use small words. I'm not as bright as you. Mother. Oh. Watching your vicious bastard die gave me more relief than a thousand lying whores. <laughs> is this how justice is done in the veil? <laughs> I'm not threatening the king, sir. I am educating my nephew. Bronn, the next time Sir Merwin speaks, kill him. That was a threat. See the difference? If I have failed you, my queen, forgive me. <sighs> I miss you, Tyrion. The scene ends with him saying everyone has the best intentions, but none of that matters, meaning that Tyrion is signing off on Varys' death. What? Why has the dialogue gotten so fucking strange? More importantly, how can Tyrion be so comfortable with this? He is the one who is desperate to save enemy generals from slaughter, and he can't spare some begging for the person who saved his life? The person who offered him advice and friendship and has given his life new meaning on top of being primarily concerned with the well-being of the people? Seriously? This is just so fucking awesome to watch. So Varys is sitting in his dinky bedroom once again, writing another letter of treason, or the same one, who fucking knows? Who fucking cares? He hears footsteps once again and decides to burn his letter this time and hides the remains in a pot. Pretty sure that if you put that note while on fire in an enclosed space, it's going to stop burning. Oxygen and all that. Oh, fuck it, he's dead anyway. You would think they would have him arrested the moment they found out about his treason to prevent him from sending any more letters, and yet they waited until night time for some reason? Who knows how many lords now know the truth about John? I don't even know which will care or if they'll have time to act on that information. Honestly, I kind of look forward to seeing how it will affect the last episode, how the political landscape 
shape will change once all the lords know about the true heir to the Iron Throne. I'm sure it'll be fascinating. Many consider episode 6 of season 8 to be the best in the series, right? <laughs> Before leaving, Varus takes off his rings and drops them into a cup. I have no idea why. I don't know why they're significant at all. I'm sure it's a metaphor. It's part of my fucking themes. Either way, he is taken to be executed and Tyrion comes to him to say he was the one that sold him out. It was me. This, again, means that Daenerys wasn't aware of Varys' treason previous to Tyrion revealing it, and we don't know what action it was that made Tyrion conclude that Varys needed to die for, which is pretty important considering the history of these two lads. Was it the poison, the discussion, the letters? I don't know. Seems like something we should get some dialogue for. Varys is also seemingly comfortable with Tyrion condemning him to death? I don't know. He's not outraged or disappointed. Seems like something we should get some dialogue for. The other problem is that Daenerys doesn't think that keeping Varys around for his knowledge might be useful. The motherfucker has the most connections in Westeros as well as the most self-professed experience with kings and the people, but nah. Varys doesn't even argue his case or tell Daenerys that killing innocents is something he is disappointed she would kill him for trying to prevent, or why she will lose the faith of the people by betraying them or something. I dunno. Seems like something we should get some dialogue for. So he dies. Jon says nothing because he's not a character right now, and the same goes for Tyrion. And fuck, Varys doesn't even scream. That's pretty impressive considering the horrors of immolation, but yeah, he's gone. All because he has no fucking clue what he's doing when it comes to the one fucking profession he's supposed to be the goddamn best at. <laughs> Just, no, 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 you fucked his character. You, you fucked it so goddamn hard. Varus wouldn't have done any of this shit. No, nope, that's fucking stupid. No, 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 it's not Varus. Nope, hashtag not my Varus. I'm so fucking sorry, Conleth. <sighs> so what the fuck happens next? Well, Danny is in a deep depression, commenting on the death of my Sunday with Grey Asshole. It wasn't her supposed children. It was the girl she chatted with every once in a while about boys. I honestly didn't even remember why my Sunday was in the show, but now I know exactly why. What should I say would happen if you told your sister? I don't want it. I don't want it. Fucking Jake Snow over here. She killed Varys as much as I did. This is victory for her. Sansa killed Varys as much as you did? Dracarys. I don't know, kind of seems like you killed him, but maybe I don't know how fire works, and I guess Tyrion can get some blame too, but Sansa? She told fucking Tyrion a secret. For all we know, Sansa doesn't even care about Varys. She might even hate Varys and would never expect him to switch teams or even be interested in the message. In fact, it was a shock to Tyrion, a close friend of many years, that Varys had turned his cloak so fucking hard and fast. The idea that this was in any way Sansa's plan is hilarious, but I mean, she's super smart smart right now, right guys? The only way to raise characters up is to smash others down. And the sad fact is that we'll never get the conversation where Danny is asked what she thinks about the true heir getting the throne. We never get to see her say that she wants the throne regardless of the bloodlines and that was essentially just an excuse this whole time. And that she believes she simply is the best suited due to her leadership, her past, her altruism, but she ultimately reveals she simply wants it. We don't see any of this conflict because nobody fucking asks her. This is a major opportunity because that rightful aspect of her claim is what she's been repeating for the entire show. I was born to rule the Seven Kingdoms. And I will. Every time they lay out her ego-driven essay of a fucking title, you get a full sense of tism, but you also understand that she puts a huge amount of weight on being the rightful heir. You stand in the presence of Daenerys Stormborn of House Targaryen, rightful heir to the Iron Throne, rightful Queen of the Andals and the First Men. And yet the only reference we get to it being a conflict for Danny to overcome is Sam mentioning it in episode fucking one. You gave up your crown to save your people. Would she do the same? 
That's a really fucking interesting question, and we don't get to explore fucking any of it because John doesn't want it. People just don't talk to each other anymore. And don't get me wrong, they talk, it's just that it's usually about fucking or milk or chair catalogues. Rarely do they discuss things that are important, and if it is something important, not only is the conversation often cut, but they tend to bungle the important information in such a way that the story is allowed to continue the way the writers want. And hell, even if Sansa was allied with Varys, or she knew she could manipulate him, how would this be a victory? You fucking killed him! Which means Sansa would have lost a significant ally, and her attempts to prevent you from reaching the throne are back at square one. Also, hearing that people get incinerated when talking about Jon's heritage is probably not something that encourages her to spread it. Especially since he doesn't want it. I don't want it. Shut the fuck up, Jake. I love you. Oh, Jon is like a fucking NPC at this point. How do you take the driving force of the northern plot and turn him into a fucking meme? How do you do that and expect people to enjoy it? God damn. So, Danny is upset that Jon won't put a finger in her bum, and so she decides that this is the last straw and she will commit to her horrid plans. I don't be fair. I'm sorry, what? I thought that you were still banking on telling the people of King's Landing that you rescued them from the dead and that Cersei will tell people that's a lie, so once you get rid of her, you will win their love and respect. I also thought that you had two enormous armies that loved you, and the de facto king of the largest kingdom loves you, and Tyrion loves you, and Grey Wim loves you. Whether or not the fucking people of King's Landing love you is yet to be seen, but they don't love Jon either. Neither of you have met them yet, for fuck's sake. What the fuck is this dialogue? It's like a direct message message from D&D &D saying, Ah, you see, she's unhappy that nobody loves her and that means she will kill everyone. That's how humans work. I also love how she and John never discuss their issues. There's no conversation about the fact that they are related and that is standing in the way of them being closer. They also never discuss the fact that if they married, they can solve a large portion of the leadership woes that Varys and Sansa have, as well as mostly everyone else in the kingdoms. Or hell, is it the fact that she burned Varys? Who fucking knows? Nobody talks to each other anymore. But then again, you can't really complain because these things would prevent wars and executions, so that would be boring and we can't do that. Then again, I suppose it's more concerning that Jon doesn't seem to react to the fact that Daenerys says, let it be fear. You would think Jon Snow might have an issue with a bipolar ruler claiming they want to rule with fear, but we have to remember it makes sense because this isn't Jon. Also, I have to say, trying to solicit sex from Jon after incinerating someone in front of him is just not the most romantic thing to do, Danny. It's almost like they're crushing scenes together side by side because they're rushing. Speaking of which, we transition to the next scene and it has Danny in it. She's sitting on the throne at Dragonstone while Tyrion is pleading for the lives of the people of King's Landing. Seems like we probably skipped over a lot between these two scenes, but hey, we've got no time left. Tyrion points out that the people of King's Landing are no different than the people of Marine, and they deserve liberation rather than destruction. And since she saved Marine, it follows that she would save this city too. Danny counters that the people of Mir freed themselves once she arrived, implying that by comparison, the people of King's Landing are possibly pro Cersei, which is fucking hilarious. And so, Tyrion argues that the people of King's Landing are afraid, and to show any kind of resistance would be a potential threat to their families. The fact that he has to explain any of this is embarrassing. This heel turn is absolutely insane. Daenerys Targaryen chose to remain in Essos to liberate and protect people. This was a goal that superseded Westeros and the Iron throne. Taking this city will not bring you any closer to Westeros or the Iron Throne. How many slaves are there in Yunkai? 200,000. Then we have 200,000 reasons to take the city. I fought so that no child born into Slaver's Bay would ever know what it meant to be bought or sold. I will continue that fight here and beyond. Kind of forgot. This is nightmarish to watch now. It's almost like we're watching a different character altogether. Danny, if we can label this character Danny, argues that Cersei is a tyrant and she has to be removed, and the implication is by any means necessary. They are non specific about the plan to assault the city, but it goes forward regardless. Tyrion requests a peaceful outcome, assuming the city surrenders, which seems very reasonable, but we can't tell whether Daenerys agrees and Tyrion doesn't press the issue, because he is a flaccid puddle of tears at this point. Though it is interesting that Tyrion said the surrender of the city would be highlighted by the bells being rung. It would seem that D&D &D haven't rewatched older seasons of Game of Thrones very recently, because Davos, when assaulting King's Landing in season 2, said this. Is that welcoming the new king? 
I've never known bells to mean surrender. But what would he know? He only grew up in King's Landing. Kind of forgot. <laughs> Before Tyrion can leave, Daenerys informs him that Jaime Lannister has been captured and that he was trying to return to his sister. There comes a time in all forms of, oh fucking hell, how are there so many of these moments now? Just a complete and utter fuck up. <sighs> Let's break it down. How would Jamie get caught by an army that he's heading towards? He knows that they're ahead of him and they're walking away from him. Wouldn't he see them from literal miles away and simply go around them? Why, if he had decided to idiotically go through the army, would he not have been able to slip past the army by covering himself up? You know, like even with a shawl? If he ultimately ultimately got caught, why would he tell the guards that he wanted to go back to Cersei? Why wouldn't he simply tell them that he wanted to join their fight or advise about assaulting King's Landing? Or hell, that he could sneak in and mercy kill Cersei to stop all of the bloodshed? Why, if the Dothraki or Unsullied caught him and he confessed to being a traitor, would they not have immediately killed him? Why is Daenerys keeping him alive when he A. fights for the opposing team, B. is important to Cersei, C. just betrayed the team he was pledged to, D. my Sunday was just executed so clearly Daenerys is in revenge mode, and E. Sending fucking letters about Jon's heritage can earn execution status, even if you're a good guy, so surely Jaime has done worse to earn it. This is an absolute clusterfuck of awful writing. Anyone who is self-admitted to be loyal to Cersei shouldn't be allowed to live in these scenarios. And what are the Queen's commands? Kill all who follow Cersei Lannister. <sighs> That's besides the fact that I was under the impression that Daenerys doesn't take prisoners. Nothing scrubs bold notions from a man's head like a few weeks in a dark cell. I'm not here to put men in chains. If that becomes an option, many will take it. Kind of forgot. Uh-huh, that clip will become super relevant next episode too. Before the scene ends, Daenerys threatens Tyrion. The next time you fail me, will be the last time you fail me. So she's just full on evil now, that's neat. And I don't even see how she's still employing Tyrion at this point if she's willing to cut him loose the next time he fails, but whatever. Moving on, Tyrion arrives at the Northerner camp outside of King's Landing and he asks Davos to smuggle something. I need to ask you a favor. I'm not gonna like this favor, am I? Kind of weird how Davos lost his son to the Battle of Blackwater Bay and he never talks about that. Especially considering Tyrion Lannister is technically the one who killed his son, but that sort of shit is only going to get in the way at this point, so fuck it, he's just willing to do him a favor. Last time I was here, you killed my son with wildfire. Kind of forgot. Yeah, nah, you can't really just forget about something like that. Davos is essentially committing treason as a favor for a guy he should pretty much hate, which is nonsense. <sighs> Arya and the Hound then turn up to the Northerner outpost and tell the standing guard that they are going to kill Cersei Lannister, and so he needs to talk to his superior before letting anyone through, but then he doesn't, and he kind of just lets them go through. Yeah, I know, it sounds like a fucking joke, but again, the writing is so horrendously tism that this is what we have to work with. Though that's not really the big issue here. How is it that Arya and the Hound ended up getting to King's Landing after the army has arrived and set up camp, when they left Winterfell before the army Army did, and for that matter, it's a fucking marching army compared to two people on horseback. This is completely fucking backwards and we know exactly why. If Aya had turned up days ago and completed her task, the entire narrative would fall apart. Or, well, it would fall apart more. I do enjoy though that the issue of not using the most talented assassin in Westeros to avoid the war altogether is only now being considered. Think about it. She kills Cersei, the war's over. There won't be a siege. I might not even die tomorrow. But it's more of a joke than an actual strategy consideration, so... <sighs> more pressing, however, is the location of the Northern Armies. They are camped outside King's Landing, in range of the fucking archers and scorpions. For the love of Satan, why in the world is this a thing? You guys are asking to be obliterated. Good God. Tyrion then tells the Unsullied that are guarding Jaime Lannister to go away because he wants to be alone with the prisoner, and that he outranks anyone who ordered them to be there so they have to listen listen to him, and then they do. Okay, so the brother of this high-value prisoner that should be dead just ordered you to leave so that he can be alone with the prisoner and you agreed. You don't even want to check with the queen. Actually, how would Danny not have put out a restriction on this specific interaction? She has several times pointed out how Tyrion loves his family to the point of having a blind spot. Your strategy has lost us Dawn, the Iron Islands, and the Reach. Our enemies? Our enemies! Your family, you mean. Perhaps you don't want to hurt them after all. 
In fact, she has previously commented on how insanely biased Tyrion is to Jaime specifically. He came here alone, knowing full well how he'd be received. Why would he do that? Perhaps he trusts his little brother to defend him. Right up to the moment he slits my throat. I imagine she would want to keep them away from each other. But no, this all goes without a hitch, and it's easily translated to the member of the Unsullied because he speaks the common tongue. I... Uh, how? I thought Grey Wim was, like, the only one because he had lessons personally for... I don't know, whatever. So Jamie reveals to the audience how he was caught. How did they find you? Did you consider taking it off? Cersei once called me the stupidest Lannister. Jaime Lannister is not stupid, fuck off. Jaime Lannister would not get himself caught because of his golden hand. He would cover it up like he did in season 7 and like he does in this very fucking episode, you feckless hemorrhoids. Stop dropping the intelligence of characters to push the plot along, it's getting really annoying. So Jaime is convinced that Cersei might win the war thanks to the Iron Fleet and so Tyrion then says this. There won't be an Iron Fleet for much longer. Uh, okay, three scorpions out of eleven fucking slam-dunked a dragon days ago. You saw this happen right before your own allied fleet was obliterated by the same iron fleet you just said is about to be deleted. There are 1,000 ships in that fleet, and that's almost 100 times the amount that took down one dragon, you simpering toolbag. How does this statement make any sense unless Tyrion has had a lobotomy? I suppose that theory is supported by the dialogue that comes next. Tyrion decides to poke at the reason Jamie has left for King's Landing, confirming our fears. You're going back to her. To die with her. Jamie didn't leave to kill Cersei, he simply wants to be with her. It would seem his arc was always going to be what is essentially a big circle. But once we had reached half a circle over seven seasons, these chuckle fucks just reverted him back in the span of an episode. That's so fucking cool. <laughs> but it gets worse. If not for her, and for every one of the million people in that city, innocent or otherwise. To be honest, I never really cared much for them. Innocent or otherwise. What the f Fuck you intergalactic troglodytes. What universe do you live in where you think this is who Jamie fucking Lannister is? Kind of forgot. What the, what the hell are you? No! 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 You can't just forget that. That's the core of his fucking character. The reputation he garnered for himself being the Kingslayer is based entirely on him making a rough decision to kill his own king and his pyromancers to save a city of hundreds of thousands. If you surrender, I'll spare the lives of your men. On my honor. Your honor. Bargaining with oathbreakers is like building on quicksand. His entire life is defined by his investment in innocent people. There it is. That's the look. You all despise me, Kingslayer. Oathbreaker. Man without honor. You heard of wildfire? Of course. The Mad King was obsessed with it. There are such traitors everywhere. So he had his pyromancer place caches of wildfire all over the city. Finally, the day of reckoning came. I urged him to surrender peacefully. He told me to bring him my father's head. Then he turned to his pyromancer, burned them in their homes, burned them in their beds. Tell me. Your precious Randy commanded you to kill your own father and stand by while thousands of men, women, and children burned alive. Would you have done it? Would you have kept your oath then? To be honest, I never really cared much for them. Innocent or otherwise. You, I just, you, he's been butchered by one fucking line. The show doesn't even bother having Tyrion fucking deny it. He simply says, You do care for one innocent. I know you do. Fuck you, man. You should know your brother better, and so should the fucking showrunners. This is so downright balked that it contradicts not only the good seasons, but season 8 as well. Jamie dropped everything in order to fight for life itself and save the kingdoms. He nearly died to abandon Cersei and help the innocents of the world. What was this fucking scene for? And fuck, what was this? Just fan service? Oh, we thought it would be so cool if Jamie and Brienne fucked, even though Jamie is going back to Cersei the following fucking few days, because, uh, I don't know, just that's 
that's how it'd be. Yeah, that's how it'd be. <sighs> Jamie Lannister was all about recontextualization. To present one perspective and to then present it again through different eyes to help us understand he is far from a morally reprehensible character. Each of his reprehensible actions can be understood as desperate or even downright merciful in the grand scheme of things. Most of his choices will ultimately prevent additional people from being slaughtered, but we weren't necessarily privy to that because we saw Jamie. We saw his history, his actions, through the eyes of Ned Stark. When I watched the Mad King die, I remembered him laughing as your father burned. It felt like justice. Is that what you tell yourself at night? You're a servant of justice. That you were avenging my father when you shoved your sword in Ares Targaryen's back. You served him well. When serving was safe. That's where Ned Stark found me. If this is true, why didn't you tell Lord Stark? Stark? You think Ned Stark wanted to hear my side? He judged me guilty the moment he set eyes on me. It was made very clear that it wasn't about safety or a lack of morality or even a false sense of justice that Jamie wanted to bask in. It was a conflict of honour, of his oaths, and he ultimately went with his heart. This is confirmed by one of the greatest scenes in the show. But nah, nah, you just had to fuck his character so goddamn hard. Jamie wouldn't have said this shit. This is just stupid. Nobody, n Jamie, nope, no, fuck you, fuck off. You piece of shit TV show. Hashtag not my Jamie fucking Lannister. He's been treated worse than Varys because Jamie just lost his entire core. While Varys' nonsense can be looked at as him being extremely stupid at the worst possible moment. Though they still completely fucked up Varys to that cockless ham. So Tyrion then tries to get the message to Jaime that King's Landing will fall, but Jaime knows that there is only one dragon left and the soldiers on each side have equalized. This means that Daenerys might just lose, but Tyrion completely disagrees. I guess we'll see how it goes. The two brothers agree that Jaime will be released for the specific goal of getting to Cersei and having her surrender to Danny. Now, if you are like me, you may have believed that Tyrion spoke to Davos in order to have Jaime smuggled into King's Landing through that secret entrance allowing Jaime to get to Cersei well before the battle begins. But no, Tyrion wants to have Jaime try and sneak past the Northmen, the Unsullied, and the Dothraki, and then he wants him to get into King's Landing and go through the front entrance all the way up to Cersei through crowds of thousands. Davos Seaworth is the best fucking smuggler in this goddamn world, you empty-headed gremlin. Have him take Jaime right to Cersei. This is so fucking stupid. Oh, maybe I was wrong. Jaime just walks into King's Landing despite the Northmen and camp being right outside. I guess he didn't have to pass any checkpoints like the Hound and Arya did. It was obviously much easier than I thought. And for that matter, why are people trying to get into the city when it's about to be attacked by several armies and a dragon? Do you guys remember in season two when people were being killed if they tried to abandon the city? Kind of forgot. <sighs> guys, just camp out in the fucking woods for the night, okay? Might be worth it unless- Oh, right, King's Landing is a fucking desert now. This show is such a fucking disaster. Also, do the Lannisters have any idea how much of a Trojan horse they could have let in by accident here. Like, I don't know, two assassins, for example? Speaking of which, it's lucky that Aya can use multiple faces to hide her identity. Oh, she's not using that ability. That extremely useful ability that allows you to assassinate with ease. Kind of forgot. But you can't be serious. She's just going to use her normal ass face with his stark hairdo for this? I... Okay. Oh, also, it's very lucky that the Hound wasn't working in King's Landing for the majority of his life and isn't extremely well known as a specific large scarred man. It would be really awkward if he just put some rags on his head and managed to walk past many Lannister soldiers. <sighs> How does this hulking troll manage to skirt by the whole fucking city? If anything, he looks even more ridiculous than normal for fuck's sake. And why are these two walking when everyone else is in a mad rush? You guys can end the fucking war. Why are you strolling to the target? I, what the fuck? Jamie is then shown taking his hand cover off to hopefully get enough attention as Jamie Lannister, showing the audience that he knew to cover it on his way in because he didn't want to be recognized and then removing it when he wants to garner attention. Because, you know, he's not retarded. Unless someone decides he is. Kind of forgot. Shut the fuck up. Unfortunately for Jamie, he gets to the Red Keep once the gates have been closed, and so he decides to go the secret route into the Keep. Which makes you wonder why he didn't open with that.
that considering how many thousands of people were trying to get in through the main route. If only a helpful smuggler could have facilitated this, as well as one of the smartest men in Westeros coming up with such a plan. Mm, nah, I'm sure both Tyrion and Jaime are the stupid Lannister. <laughs> I would like to mention, by the way, that he was released during the night, and he was right next to the castle walls, yet it took him till late in the morning to make it to the gates. I guess time is subjective. And like I said, it's just so lucky that the Lannister army are letting everyone in. We are then shown the Golden Company is outside of the castle defences of King's Landing. Why? Why the fuck wouldn't they be in an archer formation defending the walls? Why would you- King's Landing is enormous. You are d On the good guy team, we have the Northmen randomly mixed in with Dothraki and Unsullied. Why aren't they split into factions? Do you know how annoying it is to start up a horse charge when surrounded by foot soldiers? Oh, that's not a problem because once the battle starts, they are suddenly in factions. Okay. Tyrion tells Jon that the bells mean surrender and that he is to call off his men at that point. This is Jon's reaction. Who are you anymore? Why didn't you say yes? Why are you acting like this is a tough decision? You just watched families pile into that city. Do you not want to surrender? If the request is confusing, then maybe you could ask Tyrion a follow-up question? You are Jon fucking Snow. Stop pretending like you have no agency. You were the driving force of the plot in the North for the entire show. But now? Now you're just a damp fucking waffle drifting in the wind. <sighs> Why would Tyrion be on this battlefield? He could have and should have given John this information ages ago. What possible purpose is he serving by being here, and how is it that Tyrion hasn't been arrested? Wouldn't people have realized that Jaime had escaped by now, and that Tyrion was the last to see him? Oh, we need Tyrion to do some Pikachu faces in this episode, so that's why all of the other things happened. For fuck's sake. Speaking of which, it finally begins. We cut to Euron looking out into the sky, and despite expecting Daenerys, her angle on the sun makes it so he is taken by surprise. How is his entire fleet taken by surprise when they all have different angles on Daenerys. Well, that's the magic of movie making, folks. A lot of people were thinking that since the dragons are so useless now, there had to be something additional to work with in this episode. Could it be that Danny had summoned a legion of dragons from Dragonstone? Could it be that there will be an unveiling of a secret weapon? What if Rhaegal rises from the sea, reborn and ready to flank the Iron Fleet? Yes, the fanbase is that desperate to fix this show, but nope, it's just Danny. Danny on Drogon. So let's see how that works out. Danny approaches in almost the exact same pattern that she used in the previous episode. Euron's fleet were a mere 11 in number at that point, and three of those 11 nailed their shots with only one being necessary for the kill. Thus, Danny fled the additional scorpion shots in that episode to live. But now? Now Danny is facing at least a staggering 150 ships at once. And for some bizarre reason, during the entire fucking battle, we are only shown four of them shot at her. Four of them, in fucking total. Don't believe me? Here they are. Why the fuck aren't there volleys of these fucking things? And to make matters worse, Euron's fleet is wiped out in a cutaway. We see Danny blow up about ten of them at most, while they refuse to fire on her, with the rest of the ships apparently self-combusting in the meantime, despite us being shown as much as 150 in this fight. And that's on top of us being told that there would be how many in total? I want every woman spinning flax for sails. Build me a thousand ships, and I will give you this world. The Iron Fleet, you own the seas. So here I am, with a thousand ships and two good hands. Kind of forgot. Fuck off. 1,000 ships is not something he can lie about to Cersei fucking Lannister to that fucking degree. This is just a blatant flip of the stakes. 11 ships were devastating, 1,000 are useless. Why? Because the sun is bright? Not like sailors have any fucking experience with that. How fucking insulting. Look how open Drogon is here. Look how fucking large the target is. How do you only have one scorpion firing? You also get you on firing way earlier than he normally would, preventing him from getting an easy shot. And on top of that, you get an easier shot here than Rhaegal was in the previous episode. I mean, they hit three from behind a massive fucking rock from miles away. And you get Danny being better than ever at dodging all of a sudden too. God, this is a fucking writing disaster. Oh no, they forgot Euron's men were mute. 
I got a crew for the mute. <sighs> it gets lonely at sea. Got a crew for the mute. Kind of forgot. Fucking come on! The main point is that yes, the Iron Fleet is gone. Just like that. Daenerys destroyed the entire fleet of scorpions and the walls of King's Landing with one dragon in mere moments, but the other dragon got one-shotted somehow. Okay. We then cut back to the Golden Company sitting outside of the gates of King's Landing and they fail to cast a fucking shadow. The Northmen clearly do and they have front casting shadows when facing the castle, meaning the sun is behind them and thus the Golden Company would absolutely cast shadows unless there was an insane formation of clouds. This could be explained by the idea that they shot these scenes in different places and failed to make the lighting consistent. Or the Golden Company are mostly CGI and the shadows weren't added in. Forgot for fuck's sake. The enormous 20,000 man army of the Golden Company is now presented at the front of King's Landing, and it amounts to an incredible, a Herculean 1600? It's, it's like 1600-ish, at most. <sighs> we even scan around Harry Strickland to see they're all gone on his right side after one blast from Drogon on the center of the army. So there's way less of them than expected, and they disappear. Okay. As I said, Danny then breaks through the front gate behind the Golden Company to their complete shock. Probably because they thought they were immune to fire when it comes to being next to stone, especially after what happened to John. but they unfortunately do not have his level of plot armor and are of course obliterated. They also aren't given any warning by the men manning the walls or the scorpions right above them, because apparently a dragon is hard to spot or hear, even though it's already attacked the walls. Weird that. Danny even destroys a scorpion on the main gate after the north men have made it into the city. What the hell was that guy doing this whole time? Also, why were the Golden Company even outside the walls when there's a fucking dragon on the enemy team for fuck's sake? Surely they would want an elevated position to- ah, uh, fucking whatever. Strickland is then skewered by Grey Worm, who managed to some fucking how keep up with a Dothraki charge. Oh, and that reminds me. We've seen how devastating a Dothraki charge can be. What they see is just the end of the Dothraki, essentially. Kind of forgot. And with that, the famed Golden Company are done. What a fucking waste of my and everyone else's time. As the assault continues, we see Danny casually wiping out more and more of the scorpions as if they aren't even fucking manned. One of these things. They only needed one to kill Rhaegal. The f Fuck. I guess we don't need to understand the stakes anymore, we should just enjoy the fucking colours. I just love this shot of King's Landing being attacked by Drogon. You have a shit ton of scorpions right here. They are manned, but they aren't aiming at the dragon. They aren't even trying, and you have what is essentially most of the wall of King's Landing completely unharmed. There's just a shit ton of scorpions that aren't even firing. But then, along with all of that, and only about ten of the ships in the Iron Fleet being shown to have burned down when viewing the fight directly, Kyburn managed just to announce that every scorpion has been destroyed, the Golden Company is gone, and the Iron Fleet is burnt. How the fuck does he know that from where he was standing five minutes ago? We don't have fucking tracking systems and phones in this world. This is only being said so that the audience understand that Danny has slam dunked the fucking war, whether or not it made any sense. Tyrion is then seen walking through the wreckage of the front gate while the fire is still actively burning and enemy soldiers are running around him. What the fuck is he doing? You are very noticeable, sir. People are aware that the imp is the hand of the fucking foreign queen. Why in the world would you be doing something so incredibly stupid? Oh, because he needs to prepare himself for Pikachu face. The Red Keep has never fallen. It won't fall today. That's a very interesting thing for Cersei Lannister to say, the woman whose life was defined by her betrothal to Robert Baratheon, the man who started the rebellion that ended in the fall of King's Landing and the Red Fucking Keep. Kind of forgot. Shut the fuck up. We then get this badass slow charge into King's Landing from our favorite characters, Jon Snow, Grey Worm, and fucking Davos Seaworth. Da Sir Davos? The man who can't fight for shit, the man who's a fucking smuggler, whose specialty is the fucking sea, who only fights when resources are spread extremely thin and there's no other option and he still ends up on the back line in those scenarios? I've never been much of a fighter. Apologies for what you're about to see. <laughs> 
kind of forgot. Stop saying that. Look at this. During their badass walk, this guy just allows himself to get killed by a Lannister soldier that was clearly coming in from in front of him. And then John just hits the guy with his sword like a lightsaber and he just goes down. Armor means nothing as per usual and the choreographers skipped this bit, I suppose. Regardless, further on in the city, there is a sudden stalemate. A huge crowd of Lannister soldiers are blocking the apparent single road in King's Landing and the army of Northmen are just staring at them. There comes a- How? How is this happening with the chaos of a city under assault with soldiers both on foot and on horseback charging through? Oh, of course, because we need the coming scene to happen. But before that, the fight is essentially over. The Lannister men surrender and the city is taken. Typically in Westeros, which is important because all of these guys are Northmen, you take prisoners, you clamp them in irons, and at the very least, you take their weapons and sort them into groups, etc. Fighting a war with honor and all that. So what does Jon do? Well, the weapons are thrown down and then there's this long series of looks, people giving good old looky-loos, just waiting for something, good old something. I'm not even kidding, like I'm drawing out this explanation to simulate how much looking there is. Jon Snow, instead of making decisions as a leader, is literally put on pause because he's not a character in this episode. <sighs> Moving on, we- oh my god! God, what the fuck? That's where the Iron Fleet were? Are you fucking kidding me? The Iron Fleet were that fucking far away? Holy shit. Danny didn't even need to destroy them to take King's Landing. What the hell? I... J Okay, so Danny has obliterated all of the significant forces that belong to Cersei. No Iron Fleet, no Scorpions, no Golden Company, and we get a shot of her looking over her achievement with what we can call mixed feelings. Also, it would seem they gave her the fight makeup while forgetting to give her the gaunt makeup on top of it. Like, she pretty much looks fine now compared to her starved self earlier. Perhaps she got that Snickers after all. Regardless, the bell begins to ring, and curiously, they don't show who rang it, which is a strange strange thing to leave up in the air because they even have the city folk begging Cersei to ring it just moments before. No, seriously, listen to this clip. You would think that if Jamie rang it, the show would let us know, since it is yet another city-saving act. But if it was a random, like a civilian doing it, that's also pretty significant. And hell, it would be even more layered as a conflict if it was some random soldier that ended up ringing the bell, but we never find out for sure. Seems like wasted potential. But anyway, we cut to Cersei looking downright relieved once it's rung, and the conflict appears to be over. Only something else happens. There comes a time in every, in every media, media they don't that drink is all of the wine that comes from the idea of one is I don't, step but then they one is massive no, for mankind. It doesn't always do as it be, but sometimes it does. Derived from the milk. <sighs> I just, the, no, 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 no. You just, you fucked up her character so goddamn hot. Danny wouldn't do that. No, that's fucking stupid. No, nope, this isn't Daenerys. No, fuck no, fuck you, fuck off, you piece of shit TV show. Hashtag not my dimensions, Daenerys fucking Targaryen. What the fuck am I watching right now? She's literally burning children. This is her whole fucking thing. She doesn't kill innocent people, she saves them. This is at the core of her fucking character. It's what fucking drives her, you loathsome cunts. How do you fuck up a character to this degree? Fucking hell. Oh. Right. Can we just change our own timeline at this point? This is so wrong it hurts to think about. You can't just- Okay. okay. We're gonna come back to it. For now, yeah, this character wearing Daenerys' skin and using her titles, deciding to incinerate the surrendered men, women, and children of King's Landing to the point of hunting them down specifically is not someone I recognize. I mean, she's doing all of this to the horror of Cersei fucking Lannister, which would make some sense, right? That Cersei is afraid for her life as the foreign queen flies her dragon straight towards the Red Keep? Well, that's not really what happens. Daenerys kinda just goes off in some random directions first and massacres everyone but Cersei. And as a result, Cersei is horrified? This is very confusing because many might say that Cersei has openly admitted to hating the people of King's Landing. Tyrion is more than aware of this. I figured that Cersei using people as a meat shield would have tipped off old Daenerys, but no. It's in that moment on, on the walls of King's Landing when she's looking at that symbol of everything that was taken from her when she makes the decision to make this personal. How the fuck does this make it personal when Cersei's never cared about these people and actually tried to use them to protect herself? 
enough. That makes Danny look like an idiot. But in the same vein, why is it working? Making Cersei look like she's kind of losing her mind? Cersei does not like these people. She never has, and Danny knows this. The lowest among us are no different from the highest if you give them a chance and approach them with an open heart. An open heart is what you'll get in Flea Bottom if you're not careful, my dear. A million people live in this city. They're about to become a million more soldiers in the army of the dead. I imagine for most of them it would be an improvement. Kind of forgot. You can't use that excuse forever, you demented ballsack. I reckon the reason they had her do this was that they wanted to have her destroy the majority of King's Landing so that she is definitely morally reprehensible, as opposed to morally grey, but they also had to show some form of a goal that was reasonable to fuel this moment. So from there they tried to show that she had the one goal in Cersei Lannister, but that she also needed to destroy everything? Can you imagine the pitch meeting for this? Like there's that one crazy dude who desperately wants it to happen and he's trying to convince the other producers. Danny is pissed because she's lost a lot of people, all right? Uh-huh. She's gonna be so mad that she may make a few decisions that are questionable at best. Mm-hmm. She might even brutally kill some people. Like Cersei? Like Cersei, yeah, but as she approaches her, all of King's Landing is in the way, so she kills it. I'm sorry, kills what? She kills all of the people of King's Landing as she tries to kill Cersei to get revenge. That doesn't make any sense at all. Why wouldn't she just kill Cersei? We have to have her kill everybody. How else can we do that? Why the fuck are you trying to make it so that she kills everyone? Well, how else will the audience know that she's a bad guy? You are the epitome of a shitty writer. What? You haven't even considered the themes. And so we receive this gobbled mess where she is clearly motivated to destroy Cersei specifically, but then she fucking veers off and begins to obliterate the innocent city folk for no reason at all. Cersei is only killed as a fucking coincidence. I didn't be fair. Daenerys, do you understand that having a fucking dragon is something of a source of fear in the first place? Do you get that when you parked your flying plot-armored reptilic tank fuck on the battlements of King's Landing, people were screaming for surrender? You had them in the palm of your hand. And how much would they then appreciate you while fearing your power and control if you spared their lives? You know, like your fucking ancestors did when they first took over Westeros. I don't believe they killed everyone. When you burn people, when you burn people's families, that fear turns to rage. You fucking mushroom. Look, either way, we gotta slow this moment right the fuck down and do multiple takes because this is a disaster in storytelling. All of the innocent people start getting obliterated, and as a result of Danny's choice, Grey Worm decides to start killing the surrendered soldiers. Because apparently, everyone was just standing here for fucking ages not making any further decisions. It's pretty frustrating that Grey Worm fails to see that these guys aren't that much different than slaves to Cersei at this point, but we have the excuse that he's just too emotional about losing his Sunday. That's his whole character now. They took my Sunday. I am bad. Regardless, now that someone has died, the fucking Northmen begin to assault all of these surrendered weaponless men. <sighs> You're probably wondering how this could happen. Especially when you have John fucking Snow, the free folk pardoning, peace-seeking king in the north standing right there. Well, John's reaction is that of Pika fucking Chew. Again. Motherfucker, who are you? You should be outraged. You should be fucking arresting Grey Worm. You should be calling a full retreat immediately. You should be barking all kinds of orders across this battlefield. But he does fuck all. <sighs> Fuck. The Lannister army then, as they should, pick up their weapons for the fight to continue, and very much like the Tismy elements in episode 3, dumb things happen during the action. Check out this hilarious moment where Grey Wim charges into a fucking horde of Lannister men who are again near armed, and the nearest support for Grey Wim is a guy two meters away, with the rest of the army nowhere near. So he's dead. Definitely dead. Or not, either way. We then get some great Pikachu John shots again, because you see, if you have your characters stand around like muffins, then you can make whatever you want happen on screen. In this instance, he clearly needs other people to tell him that something is wrong before he can see it that way. Regardless, he finally wakes up and tells, like, two of his men to stop, but that doesn't work because a random Lannister soldier decides to attack John and forces him to continue the fight. Look at this fucking battlefield. You have John all the way over here, and the nearest Lannister all all the way over here. You then get John telling his men to stop engaging after having stayed still, and what then? A Lannister soldier moves from this front line, past all of his support, and through several hostile Northmen, all the way over to attack this one specific dude. The one dude 
dude who is trying to stop the men from attacking. The one dude who has the authority in this scenario to stop the men from attacking. Why the fuck would that ever happen? Well, because the plot needs to stop John from stopping his men by any and all contrived means. Combat writing at its fucking worst. Grey Worm also seems to disapprove of John throughout this scene. I'm not sure if it's because John doesn't want to kill innocent people and Grey Worm does because he lost any semblance of a character. Or it could be because Grey Worm doesn't have a chin and thus John intimidates him. Either way, Grey Worm starts killing people with some extremely lame choreography. Check it out. You got a poke? Spin? Poke? Spin? Poke? Poke? Tap with back of spear? Long poke? Poke? Slash and poke? How is this the peak form of the guy who is the commander of the most skilled army in Westeros and Essos put together? Kind of forgot. Fuck's sake. We then see Cersei reacting to this whole thing and it's utterly hilarious. I genuinely love this face she's making. It's like she's completely bewildered that Daenerys would even bother burning the people instead of burning her. She is of course distraught that she's losing her kingdom, but she also seems to be confused that Danny's just murdering people for no reason. Not even Cersei will go out of her way to kill all of these people for no reason, and she hates them. This reaction shot is totally happening in my videos from now on, by the way. So we then see that Daenerys, who is always spotted at the base of Drogon's neck when in flight, is now gone from there during her killing spree in more shots than one for some reason. It would seem the effects department may have taken a few shortcuts. And look, these men here just kind of forgot they were on fire. Every episode seems to have its very own version of the Starbucks cup. Wonderful. Tyrion is looking shocked because, I mean, it's pretty much all he can do now. Then we see Davos is actively trying to save the civilians of King's Landing while the other Northmen are cutting them down and raping them. So now the audience is downright fucking confused. Who's in charge? Why why is everyone suddenly evil? Didn't your enemies surrender? Where are the Unsullied and why is Grey Worm the only one of them in this scene? Did they only have him specifically so he could do a bad because he lost his Sunday? This is so fucking terrible. Like, they go as far as showing this little girl stare at a woman getting her throat slit by a northerner. <laughs> Okay, they clearly want to send a message to the audience about the ebb and flow of the evils of war, and how both sides in times of pressure or hardship will commit evil acts, but I'm just sitting here feeling fucking insulted. It's not as simple as men become evil when war is happen. You have to push them to desperation, you have to test their limits. It can't be five minutes into a one-sided war that they've been fully prepared for. If anything, this is the kind of time the Northerners should be fucking protesting the rape and pillage of the people of King's Landing. Because these people are innocent. This is not justice whatsoever. The idea that these men fought for the life of the realm, all of the peoples of the world, and won, only to then begin murdering and raping these same people while they scream. Fuck off. And then we have Jon Snow watching all of this, seeing a fucking Lannister soldier helping the public. W what are you doing, show? This isn't remotely subtle, consistent, or poignant. You've cobbled together a rushed vignette to try and garner appreciation for your oh-so-in depth thoughts about the nature of man and it's fucking embarrassing. One of the Northmen is just so into the idea of rape that when he's faced with his king in the fucking north personally telling him to stop, the guy tries to punch John so he gets stabbed. To clarify, he is so desperate to rape this person that he will die for it. Like I said, this is fucking embarrassing. We then see more shots of Cersei staring. She isn't hatching any kind of plan, she's just sort of standing there. Oh, there goes the Tower of the Hand. Euron, having been blown out of his ship, manages to swim to the exact same secret shore as Jaime, at the exact same time that Jaime was heading into the Red Keep to save Cersei. Euron believes that it's all over and so he would like to kill Jaime because fuck it, why not? This is so monumentally bad for so many reasons that I often think that there isn't just one scene I could ever pick as the worst for writing in this pickled abortion. So let's explore why. Do you remember the Battle of Blackwater Bay? Get down! 
Monster Davos is sent flying into the bay thanks to an explosion of fire, and eventually we find out that he washes up on some piece of rock that is so far away from King's Landing that the people who find him are loyal to Stannis, and he is almost dead. Euron is also sent flying into the bay, miles from the city, thanks to an explosion of fire, and eventually we find out that he, in five minutes, swam to safety back on shore? I mean, look how much further away from King's Landing he was compared to Davos. What the fuck? He also happened to choose the piece of land that leads to the secret entrance to the Red Keep. And so what does he do when he survives all of this? He demands a fight to the death. We are so fucked in terms of storytelling that cause and effect are downright villains to D&D. Things just happen now, no matter what they mean in reference to the scenes that came before them or after them, and it's a fucking shame. So let's kick on. How the fuck did Euron get here so fast? Look how far he had to swim in what was about five minutes at most. How the fuck did Euron swim that distance at all with all of his clothes and gear on? Don't get me wrong, an Ironborn character should be the one to do it, but he's not fucking Aquaman. How did Euron happen to swim to the one patch of land on King's Landing that Jaime was going to be using to get to Cersei? That seems awfully unlikely, doesn't it? Look how fucking big this place is. How did Euron get so lucky that he arrives in the 10 second window that he would need to bump into Jaime exactly? That's pretty incredible. Why is Euron resigned to give up and have a fight to the death? Isn't his house extremely well known for failed rebellions? Would he not make use of one of his less burnt ships and go home? Some of them look untouched in this shot, and fuck, there's a boat right there, right fucking next to him. Like, he would surely just go back to the Iron Islands and regroup instead of saying, oh, well, I give up. <sighs> the thing is, it doesn't matter, right? Euron is pretty slow here, he's tired, and he's trying to provoke Jamie, sure, but Jamie is singular in his goal, and he's more than able to simply run away from Euron. And hey, Jamie is pretty smart, he's not gonna fuck up and start a brawl with this walking disaster for no reason, right? He is trying to save the love of his life, so Jamie wouldn't be swayed whatsoever. I fucked the Queen. Children are not their fathers. Be a dragon. You have a gentle heart. A carrion. Alone in the world. It's a terrible thing. You don't want to wake the dragon, do you? Oh right, this is Jake Lannister. So they fight. Wonderful. And then we get to a thing. A really annoying thing. The show unironically cuts to Cersei Lannister's fucking wine glass getting destroyed. No, I'm not kidding. They have a shot to specifically show us the glass breaking and her looking shocked about it. <laughs> Cersei Lannister and her wine glass is such a fucking meme that they just want to try and show her downfall thematically by having it get smashed. Because that's what represents Cersei now. This episode really is the one where every character gets destroyed for fuck's sake. Speaking of which, here we see Danny casually murdering about 100 civilians because she pushed part of the Red Keep over. Wonderful! The Unsullied have breached the gates of the Red Keep. Uh, is Danny aware of this? Are the approaching Unsullied not in danger? Or is Danny so far gone in the state of tyrant sadist that killing her own men is just something she can't resist? I'm not even kidding right now, I can't help but feel pity for Cersei Lannister, crying as she watches the city burn. She didn't want everyone dead. She might have ruled well after a few years to calm down. She certainly would have been a better ruler than this shambolic stain of a character. Anyway, let's go back to the Euron Jamie fight, because that's something we all wanted to see. Jamie gets skewered by a rather long blade twice through the side of his gut, so I'm pretty sure he's dead, and what a shitty death it'll be. Even still, it's weird that Euron keeps going for his side rather than, say, his head or his heart, even when he's left wide open. I mean, it's not like Jamie's wearing armor, though he does manage to kill Euron with a stab through his gut, so woohoo, I guess? And then, as Jamie leaves, Euron decides to share something special with the audience. I'm the man who killed Jamie Lannister. What the hell does Euron even think he's accomplished here? Yes, he wanted to kill Jaime Lannister, I think, but Jaime doesn't have his sword hand. He's nowhere near the warrior that Euron knows him as. Euron even recognizes this. He fought well for a cripple. 
So why the fuck are you so proud? And this actually brings something else to the surface. Why did Euron get so fucked in this fight when he's been shown to be pretty damn good at fighting in general, even when injured? On the other hand, Jamie is so utterly self-admitted to be useless these days that this whole thing was downright awkward to watch. The choreography is once again just garbage, wild swinging combined with quick cuts from the camera and rolling over each other. And fuck, I'm still questioning why they're fighting each other in the first place. But yeah, this is the end for Euron's character, and he seems happy about it. Nobody would even know that it was Euron who killed Jamie when this is all over since nobody is fucking here, so why is he so content? Was this fight really just for him? It's just really interesting that he goes to the grave smiling because he's killed a crippled Jamie Lannister, when just last episode Euron shot and killed a fucking dragon. You'd think that one of those achievements might outweigh the other, but no. Either way, I guess his arc is complete. He wanted to fuck the Queen and kill Jamie Lannister. Though he does get several thousand points for fucking annihilating the Sand Snakes. I apologize for reminding you of those moldy bints. Though I guess congratulations are in order. Well done, D&D. You completed the arc of one of the shittiest characters in the entire show. We then cut to the Hound explaining to Arya that she doesn't need to kill Cersei because Cersei will die anyway, and that pursuing revenge will make her end up like the Hound, dead, consumed by vengeance. Even though Arya has successfully achieved vengeance from the moment she committed herself to it, and the idea that Cersei would die in general would never put her off because she wants to be the one to do it. That's the whole fucking point. The funny part is that the Hound has killed nobody on screen for the sake of some family revenge that we're aware of, while Arya has wiped out possible hundreds at this point? I think we know who the expert is, and the idea that Arya is being convinced to give up on her entire journey culminating in the execution of Cersei Lannister completing her list and avenging the Starks because the Hound says it might get her killed is possibly one of the most rushed and derpy aspects of this episode. She is the motherfucking god of death at this point. She killed Satan, but nah, she just fucks off. Okay. The Hound then meets up with Cersei, Kyburn, and the Mountain. And with just a gambeson for armor, the Hound outfights four plate-armored Queensguard who have the fucking high ground. And this happens despite Sandor having said this. Your friend's dead, and Merentron's not. Just Tron had armor and a big fucking sword. Well, Armor's effectiveness is really more tied to the plot. So then Kyburn gets killed by the mountain, and there is no amount of context, interpretation, or references to Dr. fucking Frankenstein that don't make it fucking hilarious. So I'll just show you my live reaction with Wolf instead of saying anything else. So Gregor, stay by my side. Is he gonna speak? Obey your queen, Sir Gregor. <laughs> What? <laughs> what? <laughs> what? What the fuck? What? could save others from death, but not himself. And that leads us to Clegane Bowl. Yay! But first, Cersei needs to keep heading to safety, and thus she carefully tiptoes past the Hound, and he just sort of lets her go? Okay. Even the show was hoping we would just let that slide by having the Hound keep his eyes on his zombie brother as if he doesn't have standard human peripheral vision. But the thing is, Cersei has a different arc to wrap up in a different way, so we've got to get her out of here no matter how awkward it looks. And so the epic battle begins. The show has paid off the biggest meme. I'm glad they managed to pull that off compared to, you know, the meaningful stuff. The Hound swings at the mountain a few times and then stabs him with his sword straight through his armor. Both sides of the armor, in fact, with the possible addition of chainmail underneath. He pierced it all. I just... As the fight progresses, the mountain picks up and throws the Hound. And then he does it again. And again. And again. And again. 
which is definitely the best way to extend this fight scene while keeping me on the edge of my sleep. The hound then decides to stab the zombie's arm with a knife and is frustrated that he isn't dying. Fucking God! Why are you frustrated that he won't die after hitting him in the arm when he just pulled a fucking sword out of his chest, you absolute creature? Mate, he's a zombie. Go for the head. Oh, okay. So then, as the mountain pulls the knife out of his head, the hound tackles him off the staircase and out of the tower, killing them both. We knew that these two were going to die together, and we knew that the hound's death had to be a death by fire. So the one thing stronger in the hound than his fear of fire is his hatred of the person who put that fear there in the first place. Um, I'm pretty sure that's a death by fucking gravity, but whatever, you're the showrunner. Cersei then goes downstairs and finds Jaime, who is still somehow alive and walking about despite being gutted twice. Okay. Pretty lucky for Jamie that she didn't go to Magor's Hold Fast or the caverns at any other point than the time he happened to enter this room, but all right. They make their way underground and find that their passage is blocked off by several bricks. Jamie and Cersei then resign themselves to death by falling rocks, since they couldn't possibly climb and remove those bricks. They couldn't even try. Ugh, you can literally see light up there, you chronic retards. Jamie even seems to start moving bricks on this other pile. What the fuck are you doing, mate? The other one is like got a literal gap at the top of it. <sighs> and so Jamie and Cersei are totally splattered by tons of bricks. They are dead. But they cut away, so I'm sure they're fine. Oh. So it turns out that Cersei really did have no plan except to stare from her balcony. Nothing up her sleeve. In fact, Kyburn did everything for her this season. She was more of a cardboard cutout of Cersei Lannister than an actual character. <sighs> what a fucking waste. And let's not forget Jaime, dying in her arms, solidifying his complete assassination. A thorough, embarrassing fucking shame. Arya is doing a little better than them, though, as she runs for her life on the streets like an awkward civilian. Not sure why this is, considering her years of assassin training that got her past an army of fucking White Walkers, and now it has her struggling to move past random peasants? She's bumping around the fucking structures instead of climbing some of them, or just using them to her advantage. It's a little bit bizarre. Either way, Jon finally orders the retreat for his men, because this place is becoming too dangerous to stay in, as opposed to the fact that he should retreat because his men have become rabid caricatures of soulless twats. John just... no, no. You fucked his character. You fucked his character so much this episode. John... John wouldn't be doing that. You... you awful TV sh... <sighs> you know, you can't help but feel just a little bit hollow at this point. What happened to this show? What happened to my wonderful characters? My beautiful intertwining plot lines and my detailed, immersive and thematically sound world building? It's all fucking dead. Arya is then obliterated by rubble. She is dead, but we cut away from her, so I'm sure she's fine. See, told you. She then moves around the area and spots that a building is about to fall on her, and so she runs in the direction that it's falling because Prometheus wasn't stupid enough. And so she is obliterated by rubble again. She is dead. But we cut away from her, so I'm sure she's fine. <laughs> See? Told you. Aya then convinces a group of people to leave a safe, confined space and walk into a street where Dothraki are slicing people down and a fucking dragon is making the rounds. I want to take this moment to remind you that this damp sack of marshmallows outsmarted Littlefinger. <laughs> Fucking hell. Anyway, unfortunately for Aya, she didn't realize that Danny was gonna go out of her way in this moment to incinerate injured fleeing civilians, including a fucking child weeping over her dying mother. They couldn't make this more cartoonish. And then, sadly, Aya is engulfed in flames and she perishes with them. Because Dragon Breath burns to a degree that can delete people from existence. Rest in peace, Aya Stark. You will be remembered. Then again, they did cut away, so maybe she's- Ah, there she is, thank goodness, I was so concerned. So waking up with Aya, we see that she looks and beholds a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was Death, and Hell followed with him. Such wonderful symbolism that many writers will talk about till their deaths. My themes will be strong with this one, though the idea that this horse is unharmed and just chilling out in this street is hilarious. Thank goodness something could save Aya 
here at this point. I'm sure she was almost out of lives. Also, I guess Danny has stopped the attack and I have to wonder what would have made her stop, since whether Cersei is dead is not something she'd even be able to be aware of and the people already surrendered, so she's not waiting for that either. Is it just a literal kill count she's trying to reach? Or is she trying to lawnmower her way throughout all of King's Landing and then she'll be done? I guess she's just insane. <sighs> and with that comes the end of this absolute shit show of an episode. Oh my god. So, what just happened? Well, Game of Thrones has shat the bed. Or, well, it shat the cosmos. The entire show has been released now, so we can finally make a lot of definitive statements about the quality of writing and the scope of the story from start to finish. Episode 6 will have its time, as well as a possible breakdown of the series as a whole, but for now, let's consider what we just saw. Game of Thrones Season 8 Episode 5 was a catastrophic failure that brought about disdain from even the most loyal of fans. It went straight for the jugular, the reason so many people are invested in the show. The characters. As I've said previously, my investment got booted out in episode 3 when the theming and world building was struck down in favour of pushing the plot in directions the writers wanted on top of generating shock value at any cost. Following that, in episode 4, many had their interests snuffed out once the plot was torn to shreds in order to push certain characters into certain situations as well as dealing with insane contrivances all around. And all of it was to prep the characters for slaughter. A lot of the themes of this episode are very much dead on arrival. That there is a beast within us all, that we all have a breaking point and ultimately drawing these lines of good and bad is far more complex than we were led to believe. Which is interesting because some of these have been nailed in extensive character journeys already in this show, some of which have been ruined this episode. But the horrors of war showed us that we shouldn't even bother caring for the Northmen as they are no more noble than Walder Frey. The idea that a beast is within every man is not something the showrunners have committed to previously. There are many altruistic characters. Not to mention that this very episode disproves the notion as Jon and Davos are left unscathed in terms of committing any evil acts. They apparently lack the innate desire for death and pillaging, yet their men do not. But in favour of allowing this message free reign over the episode, John and Davos arbitrarily lose command over their own men. And so, thanks to that, some inane level of depth can actually be drawn out. In the case of Danny specifically, according to the events of the episode, it's either her inherited madness as a Targaryen, or her developing, foreshadowed, power-hungry character that brought her to genocide. This, rather than a beast lying within her as with all of man. We never quite know for sure, and discussions online flip between the two explanations while desperately trying to defend the complete U-turn. And so an attempt to blend the thematic elements of the episode was made, no matter how clunky, reaching a climax of a white horse splattered with blood, to possibly symbolise the show and its once pure straightened edge of storytelling being bludgeoned by the petulant sentient intestines known as D&D. So let's break it down. The world is once again about as relevant to the stakes of this season as it always is. The size of Westeros is ever more Thing. Characters arrive at the areas they need to when they need to instead of being locked in by geography. How exactly Jamie and Cersei are going to make it to Pentos in a dinky fucking rowboat, I have no idea. Arya and the Hound should not only have been in King's Landing well before Jon, but Cersei should have been killed well before Danny had even attacked, which may have made for a greater storyline. The idea that Danny attacks a city with no queen without realizing because she refuses to wait. Tweaking or downright changing the script completely is so very tempting, but let's Let's lay off that for a moment, shall we? Going back to the world building, we still don't know what other houses really remain outside of Stark, Targaryen, and Lannister. We don't know what power they possess or what side they fight for outside of throwaway comments for one or two of them. We're not only limited in the amount of land that exists, but also the people who inhabit it. And of course, we have no idea how the world feels about the White Walkers now that they are free of them. For the most part, I imagine the people of Westeros don't know they even existed outside of a handful in Winterfell. 
well. Do the Stormlands care about any of this? Do they have a team to choose outside of Gendry being thrust upon them? What about the Tullys? Would Edmure not have access to the armies of the Riverlands since he would have been liberated after the Freys were wiped from existence? Is the Dornish Prince going to provide support from the rear? Perhaps we should wait for Yara to move his armies. Or hell, ask Dawn to come up to King's Landing by foot. Do people send ravens anymore? What about the Reach? Is Sam Tarly the actual lord for that region? Is there another lord? Did Cersei have another ally there? Did any of these people get ravens from Varys? Do they care that Jon is the rightful heir? Does anyone really? What's going on? And hell, what about the Ironborn? Yara's ships would have been extremely useful against Euron's fleet had they attacked with Drogon at their back, and the victory would have been far more believable. Yes, she went to retake the Iron Islands, but Euron took them in an afternoon, so I doubt it was too much of a problem. And as for the Eyrie, I guess they went home after the Battle of Winterfell. Or stayed with Sansa? I don't know. I have no idea, because I don't know what their lord thinks, and I don't know what his people think of him. Speaking of which, the people of King's Landing are still in no position of revolting against Cersei for some reason. Apparently, repercussions are just not relevant unless they serve certain people's ideas. As far as we can tell, the people are almost pro-Cersei. Perhaps it's because of the frightening Golden Company she's brought to their shores. You remember their numbers being extremely threatening, right? 20,000 men, is it? Yes, Your Grace. Horses. 2,000. So 22,000 units. It sure looked like it when you were fleeing from a dragon you were apparently unaware of with your remaining handful of men after losing what? A few hundred? Samwell fucking Tarly killed more people than the entire Golden Company. A fucking boar killed more people than the entire Golden Company for fuck's sake. Where were the 2,000 horses though? I saw fucking one. How do you fudge numbers this hard? Then again, no army is consistent whatsoever in the show. <sighs> Why even have them as a faction in this story? From a writing standpoint, they are bizarre. If they weren't here, Danny's victory is more believable. But they kept them, as if they want them to be a fucking meme. Like, who is Harry Strickland in the show? Is he the leader of the most badass sellsword company in Essos? Or is he some cowardly asshole? Like, why did they bother to have him portrayed like an idiot, slobbering and hobbling away before being taken out by Grey Worm? Which is another thing, what did Grey Worm have to do with him at all? Why did he need to be the guy who skewered Harry Strickland. Like, they made him as fast as the Dothraki in an attempt to have that moment. Speaking of the Dothraki, they've been lovingly restocked and they actually seem to make a big difference, unlike the Unsullied, who are essentially represented by Grey Worm alone and his piss-boring choreography. For some reason, armor means less than shit now and there's no sword craft to behold either. You don't even get the good old flashy but dumb stuff. Like, look at this, Jon Snow kills Lannister soldiers because they walk right up to him, he counters their swing and hits them on what I can only assume is their armor, only for them to die. K. The Hound does the same thing, though he seems to go for the gaps between the armor without taking a scratch of damage despite them having the mighty high ground. But then he forgets those benefits once he comes against the mountain. He ends up wailing on the plate itself, only to then stab right fucking through it. Why couldn't you have given him Valyrian steel just to make it slightly more believable? Oh, I miss better times. Your friend's dead. And Meron Tron's not, because Tron had armor. Bad pussy. So, how about them dragons? They're looking pretty powerful now. The breath is not only fucking infinite, but it breaks apart castles in split seconds. And so, it makes you wonder why the Night King didn't just send the zombie dragon in to open the fight with a suicide run on Winterfell, and leave the castle vulnerable to a major on-foot attack, destroying a huge portion of their defenses. I mean, fuck, one fucking dragon burns the entire city. For some reason, Danny did a more passionate passionate cleanup of innocent women and children than the army of the undead. I just, unlike the fire washes bricks apart, but when it comes to people it sets them on fire so they can run around screaming for a bit. I guess flesh is stronger than stone now, unless they decide it's not and you get vaporized by the fire if you're a person. I love how much consistency there is to this, it really helps me understand the stakes. God damn, the Iron Fleet were unironically worthless compared to the previous episode. I'm not sure what we're meant to make of them as a whole other than a shifty plot device led by the world's most unappealing and obsessive mollusk. I guess the conclusion there is that the rules in relation to the world are all fucked. Tyrion spent two seasons telling Danny not to attack King's Landing to prevent the civilian casualties, but as we saw in the fucking episode up until the bells rang, she had complete control in about five minutes. She obliterated all of the city's defenses and had Cersei in the palm of her hand. If she hadn't proceeded to go mad, it would have been one of the greatest victories 
series in the history of Westeros, a clean removal of the current tyrant and an installation of one that recently saved everyone from death personified. Danny achieved that with one dragon. She could have done this at the end of season 6 during the time it took her armies to travel across the ocean. She intended to use the power of the Unsullied, the Dothraki, the Dornish, the armies of the Reach, the Iron Islands, the North, and the Riverlands, but it means fucking nothing. She only needed Drogon. This makes so much of the squabbling amount to nothing. This could have been completed before Jon even came to see Danny. It's utter garbage. Think about this for a second. Jon doesn't even consider waiting on telling his family the truth about himself, and as a result, Varys doesn't hesitate to decide that Daenerys is a lost cause, despite the fact that Missandei just died and Daenerys hasn't actually done anything yet. She trusted her advisors for two seasons about King's Landing, and the first time she commits to this plan instead of theirs, they give her the old stink eye, and yet hers results in the least death possible, at least until she goes all Hitler on us, which I guess in retrospect makes Varys' actions totally reasonable. Oh, it's all so fucked. She could have knocked out Cersei at the end of season 6, and the rest of the show could have been about the White Walkers taking over the world and everyone having to band together to stop them. But nah. It's like I said, nothing is right in this episode. No! No, you're supposed to say loose, you fucking fridge magnet. <sighs> Alright, let's move on to the plot. This episode was pretty confusing, again. Plenty of decisions made that are embarrassing or confusing on top of characters acting irrationally or downright insane. We are so well beyond unclear of what exactly happened in the opening. What characters knew what exactly, how they managed to know what they potentially knew, and what information led them to extreme actions. And all of this vagueness raises the question of just what the hell Tyrion thought would happen in the first place when telling Varys that Jon is the true heir. You look back and you wonder why he would even bother. What did Tyrion expect? Did he just want Varys to say, oh wow, neat. Skipping forward, you then get the insane placement of the armies, both the good guys putting themselves in a blatant position of immediate death, and the bad guys choosing not to capitalize on it. Like, look, they could literally, you could throw something. Gravity is on your team here. Then there's how people are moving in or out, and how or why. All of it is very hard to understand logistically, and you know that they don't use many angles in order to avoid and answering any geographical questions. For example, this Northman is trying to control the area surrounding King's Landing, and yet he walks off to talk to his superior and we don't see him again. Why even bother stopping them in the first place if you just let suspicious people go anyway? It becomes very obvious that this scene exists solely to tell the audience that Arya and the Hound have not yet made it into King's Landing. The writers know the audience might think otherwise, since they should have been here long before the Northmen. Regardless, we're already aware that the blockade set up by the Northmen didn't do shit. Many civilians still made it in, including Jaime Lannister. Moving on to the morning, you have to acknowledge that the Stark army combined with the Unsullied and Dothraki are almost worthless without the dragon. They literally stop at the gates and wait for Danny to essentially remove the Golden Company. They have no siege equipment and they don't seem to have all that many men, and yet look at what they're against. What if Drogon was punted down by a single scorpion shot, which was incredibly fucking likely? Were they going to slap their swords against the gates? Would they all just sort of go home? What if the Golden Company had charged at Jon's men before Drogon even got there? They very likely would have dominated, especially if they had the numbers that were promised. 20,000 men, is it? Horses. 2,000. Kind of forgot. <laughs> Once the walls of King's Landing were obliterated, Kyburn reported that there were no scorpions left, which means Danny could have gone to the Red Keep undefended and nuked Cersei from the get-go. She could have just bitten Cersei off the fucking balcony with Drogon and the war would have been over in seconds. Although we did get a masterful payoff while the city was falling. For those complaining that Jon never got to fight the Night King, be thankful that they gave us Jaime Lannister versus Euron Greyjoy, which is something everybody has wanted for years. <sighs> then we reached the whole 
whole Arya running in the street thing. The reason we decided to follow Arya out of King's Landing and to, to see the fall of King's Landing through her eyes is you just care a lot more when you're with a character that you care about. So if we saw a lot of extras running around and buildings falling apart, it might have been visually interesting, but it wouldn't have had much of an emotional impact. So we followed Arya because she is someone we care about, implying that we wouldn't care about the event with the women and children getting raped, horrifically murdered, and incinerated without her. That's actually insane. D&D &D seemed to think that we really just don't care about these people or that we would need to be manipulated in order to care about them. I guess that should give you some insight into how much D&D care about civilians and why it was so easy for them to write that Danny killed them all. <laughs> also, if you need a POV character to follow in King's Landing, you don't use Arya. She spent very little time in King's Landing and she wants all of the people there dead to a degree. Not to mention that we are very unclear about her values on life at this point and Arya's plot armor is thicker than any any other characters. So, are there any other candidates? Well, what if we followed Gendry, a character who was born and raised in this city, knowing the people of it, working to help liberate them, only to see them all burned under the rule of his new queen? You could even have moments where he is recognized by several of the screaming city folk. But if that doesn't work, what about focusing John? Imagine him getting separated from his men early on, and we see him struggle to help more and more civilians while the buildings fall around him, as those people are genocided, knowing that his people went through the same thing, and from there, he has to rescue more and more of his enemies by going further and further into the city. Not to save it from Cersei, but to save it from Danny. But if that's not working, how about using Tyrion? He decides to try and reach the Red Keep to complete the job he set for his brother, only to realize that Cersei's surrender was no longer relevant, and as he saw more and more death, he tries to get her out, only for it to become clear that his family's lives were forfeit in the attack attempt to win the city for his new queen, as well as his own. And then if we really are comparing any characters that have more meaningful points of view than Arya, then what about Sir Davos, the man who knows King's Landing inside out, the man who is essentially associated with more of the people of Flea Bottom than anyone else. He cares more about justice than his own life. To have him fight these soldiers only to end up trying to save them and realize that this game has gone way too far could be very effective. He could then lead the evacuation evacuation, he could end up commanding the terrified Lannister armies, and once the buildings fall and the fires rain through the streets, he questions just what the fuck all of this was for, sowing mistrust and allowing more characters to fall away from Danny. Hell, you could run all of these mini-stories at once, or you could focus in on one of them, or you could do what the show did and have a tiny amount of Pikachu Tyrion, combined with a chunk of Jon and Davos waddling about, wondering who they even are eight seasons into this show. And then you can over focus on Arya, the girl who shouldn't even be alive, let alone dealing with all of this. I am jumping ahead here, but we do know that we don't see Alaria Sand again, so was she buried by all of this? Did she escape? Does anyone care? Kind of forgot it. Is there anything you guys remember? The most depressing thing about the plot in this episode is how much it reveals the time that was wasted previously. They only needed to kill Cersei. After that, you have Zombie Mountain and Kyburn being the only remaining opposition, and that's if Kyburn doesn't give up. And so, when we realize that, we simply need to make a quick assessment of resources for the final battle, as Danny calls it. We have Davos, a master smuggler. We have both of Cersei's brothers. We have a man who can see the past and future. We have Varys, the master of whispers, who may be able to facilitate Cersei's assassination himself thanks to his extensive network of spies. But most importantly, they have Arya Stark, a skilled assassin who has the power to disguise her face and is so stealthy she can appear from thin air. Attacking the city via brute force was one of the most obvious choices you could have made. There's no finesse, no skill, and it puts your own resources at maximum risk. And yet it's the most one-sided war in the history of Westeros. We had to plod through two seasons of bullshit because they didn't know what to do without Cersei being a villain that effectively cripples Danny's sanity. So they inflated it, artificially. And that's despite one of the suggestions that I just gave actually being used. Almost. Arya does intend to assassinate the Queen herself, ending the war, but she doesn't let anyone know that plan outside of this random guy. She allows her family to put themselves in great danger. It's almost as if she is completely unaware that they want to attack Cersei while she wants to as well. As if these stories don't take place alongside each other, in the same world. Speaking of which, Danny and Jon's alliance allowed them to defeat the Night King and Cersei Lannister together, even though Danny's forces were essentially deleted 
during the Night King fight, and John was not required to defeat Cersei whatsoever. And so these interactions are very satisfying for the audience. It's so incredible to see all of these plot lines intertwine and lead to nothing significant, which is essentially the point. The plot is fucked. We got quick cuts to save people's lives, extreme contrivances, bungling payoffs that have been built for a near decade, while providing payoffs that not one grimy soul on this fucking planet wanted. Plot armor is through the roof and below the fucking basement throughout the episode, depending on what the plot wants. People have unironically argued that Euron mistook the dragon for a bird, and that's why Danny was able to defeat the Iron Fleet this time around. These people are fucking desperate to fix your shitty script. Also, did Bran know what was going to happen in King's Landing and he just didn't care enough to say anything to anyone? Is Bran a secret cunt? Speaking of which, let's get to the characters. This one's gonna be rough. It feels like I'm writing a full movie review at this point. It should be said that there are some characters who won't turn up in this summary, but that doesn't mean they weren't fucked or cast aside in some way, shape, or form. I don't think any character managed to survive this shit show without damage, so let's talk about them from least fucked to most fucked. Euron Greyjoy. What a wonderful character. His purpose is to teleport when needed, have incredible skills when needed, and to lose the ability to shoot a giant flying fuck-off Godzilla monster when needed as well. He has to ferry more soldiers and more resources when needed, and essentially be Cersei's bitch all because he wants to fuck her. He also had a small back and forth with Jamie, implying that they may have some form of a conflict, and his story ended with fucking the Queen and killing Jamie. Sort of. So I guess that's great for him? I suppose it's a pity that he's a one-dimensional tismic meme for most of his dialogue and his presence in general. He doesn't even seem to be from this era. He's like a cringy pirate that found a time travel machine and used it for a fucking joke. But it's not like his writing doesn't have issues. Euron Greyjoy, the man who killed Balon Greyjoy, captured Yara Greyjoy, and tormented Theon Greyjoy, had no conclusion with his family. He's not made aware that Theon died, and he's not made aware that Yara is currently retaking the Iron Islands. So the element of Greyjoy about Euron is out the fucking window. It's almost like his family and his position and his wants and needs in the story are completely fucking irrelevant now because he's being used as a tool by better characters. He doesn't even seem to care that his child is dying. What a worthless fucking ca- Fuck, I just realized that Yara doesn't even react to Theon's death. <sighs> okay, we're gonna have to get to that next time. Moving on, we have the Hound. A man whose story is honestly very unclear. I suppose it's best summed up as him being out for himself and only serving where it's safe to, to then abandoning his king and kidnapping someone of value in order to get himself to a semblance of safety once again. He then joins a weird clan of peace people that all get killed, and he decides to jump back into the fight thanks to what he saw in the flames, which is something I guess we'll never really know shit about, and ultimately he wants to go kill Gregor. People talk about how killing the mountain was set up since the early episodes, but fuck, there's only a handful of statements made throughout the entire show that relate to it. This shit is pretty light in terms of development, and I would posit that it's only nailed for the fans because it's a huge meme. If the Hound was so fucking obsessed with killing the mountain to the point that he's going to sacrifice himself, then what has he been doing this whole time? It would seem that this interest was provided to him by the audience rather than the world and his character's journey. Seeing this scene is almost like watching a fucking fan fiction video, which is ironic because D&D talk about about taking John's victory away due to it being too obvious. What was more fucking obvious than Clegane Bowl? <sighs> the point is that his journey seems to take a U-turn from where it might have been heading to align with fan expectations, which is less than great when the expectations are fueled by fucking memes. And so they fight, until a thematically suitable ending in which the Hound defeats the Mountain with fire by overcoming his fear of it is finally shown with as much dramatization as you can imagine. Or that's what the internet might have have you believe. Personally, I would say that the Hound had no fucking clue that fire was at the bottom of that chasm and that he pushed the mountain through the bricks in the hopes that the fall from terminal fucking velocity would simply kill them both. And fuck, I think it would have been smaller and yet far better if the Hound had knowingly tackled the mountain into a room that was on fire and they died together. But hey, whatever themes. Sandor Clegane's story honestly seemed to close out this way because D&D had read discussions online and wanted to have a meme come to life. And as a 
result, I think we missed out on something far more meaningful. Also, side note, why did the mountain randomly think for himself all of a sudden and kill Kyburn? Does that not break everything we've come to understand about him? I love that people reference Dr. Frankenstein as if that's the answer to this sudden nonsense when there is nothing like this in the story. Like, do you people understand that if aliens invade Westeros and they are defeated by having Kyburn fly a jet into the laser thing, I can't just go, ah, that's great writing, they are doing Independence Day. That's fucking nonsense. Which brings us nicely to Kyburn. It is now confirmed that he is a tool, not a character. If you trace his story, he is essentially a useful person to whomever he comes across. His motivation seems to be the pursuit of weird science, but that never presents itself beyond the plot-relevant objects or characters. He doesn't even seem to be all that evil, he's just taking orders. Like, yeah, he's just a really handy tool. And his usefulness, when thinking about it, is actually kind of insane. He is single-handedly the reason that Cersei had any fucking chance against Danny, and once his usefulness was built to extreme levels, the writers decided that the Scorpions just weren't enough. His death comes out of fucking nowhere, and it felt like D&D forgot he existed. So when filming the episode, the actor showed up and they were like, oh fuck, uh, I don't know, the mountain throws you so hard that your head explodes. Rest in peace, you bizarre character. Now let's crank it up a bit. Arya Stark. There's so much to say about Arya, about her entire story, and it's something that I'll have to get into more detail in future videos, but for now, how about that one scene that really matters in terms of her character? The Hound tells her that seeking revenge will only lead her to becoming him. It will lead her to death. And this convinces Arya to leave. This is... You, isn't this your whole thing? Arya had her moment back in Season 7 where she decided to pursue her family instead of her kill list. It seemed as though the girl who was losing her soul decided after a few choice encounters that there are more important things in life. And then, after she made it clear that family is all that matters, she decided to pursue her list. It's almost as if she's playing both character arcs at the same time. But now we can see through the writing that the only fucking reason D&D sent her up north temporarily was to have her kill Littlefinger and the Night King. It has nothing to do with her family because everything is back to normal the second that the frosty fucker is dead. And so she goes, only to U-turn again? Arya, I think you need to have a fucking word with yourself, mate. She is in a position where she has no intention of returning. She will absolutely die to complete her list and avenge the Stark family, but then she doesn't when the Hound shares with her that it might be dangerous. I guess he couldn't have explained this shit back at Winterfell or along the fucking trail. They took longer to get to King's Landing than an entire marching army who left after they did, so it's not like they didn't have time. Not to mention that Arya has been successfully pursuing revenge for a long ass fucking time compared to the Hound, who is apparently so consumed by revenge himself that he randomly decided to live a completely different life temporarily. Compare that to Arya who's had Cersei Lannister on her damn list since season two. She's been consumed by vengeance since season one. She does not give a shit about death being a repercussion of her exploits. She would not have given up on the goal because the fucking Hound says she might die for it. <sighs> I want to clarify though, Aya wasn't ruined, she was used. She was used for the writer's purposes. First, they washed her character, jarringly, bringing her back to hero status after she took some incredibly disturbing paths in her life. Aya was going to be lost and tragic, consumed by the vengeance for her family to the point where she may forget why she started, but they cut that off. She goes from being a potential terrifying monster to pretty much altruistic again in just a couple of episodes. And this is brought to the forefront in her representation as just another civilian trying her best to help the city folk. It's ridiculous, but D&D wanted her to manipulate the audience into concern and so that's where she ended up. Like I said, there's more to Arya as a whole, but perhaps that will be a discussion for next time. Which then leads us to Cersei Lannister, who is quite possibly the most wasted character in the entire show, though there is a lot of competition for that. They killed the Night King in a clumsy disaster so that Cersei could slot in as the new villain, only up to that point she'd spent her time sitting on her ass or at a balcony. And despite that, she'd generated a full force army that could repel dragons, and she got most of that out of thin air, to then have it taken away in the same vein. She was killed in a fucking drive-by because she stood in the wrong place at the wrong time. What is this shit? She spent the season doing more wine tasting than any other action, to the point that her demise is symbolized by a broken fucking wine glass. What the fuck was Cersei's plan? I read many threads saying she was baiting Danny by killing my Sunday, and she wanted to show the people of King's Landing that Danny was insane.
insane by making her insane. But naturally, that will make Danny insane. And thus, she will want, more than ever, to kill you. That's not a great plan. It's not even a bad plan, it's just awful. Did you learn nothing when you lost Ned Stark as a bargaining chip because of your psychotic fungus of a son? Why did you not keep my Sunday alive? Cersei wants the throne. If Danny is proven to be insane, it doesn't then become Cersei's. She, at best, would be considered a little less insane by comparison, but she would still be deposed. The rest of Westeros hate her, and that's assuming she even survives the war. You can't possibly expect to get away with blowing up the Sept forever. So I have to ask, what was her plan to keep the throne? Why didn't she keep Grey Worm's Sunday hostage? Why is it that she was essentially a statue throughout the episode? Where is Cersei fucking Lannister? In terms of writing, her character wasn't assassinated, thankfully, just humiliated. Cersei Lannister, despite constantly complaining that her father sold her off for alliances, hoard herself out, sacrificing her self-respect to get a defensive force that amounted to nothing. Her baby amounted to nothing. Her life amounted to nothing. Everything she learned across the entire show was for nothing. Her story ends with being brute forced out of her own power. And what's worse is she simply stands by while it happens. I can't really say she's unintelligent because she doesn't make many decisions at all, but of every decision she did make, it seemed to be the right one until it wasn't. She was a character that was entirely killed by the plot. Her wine glass got almost as much screen time as she did. Such a waste of an amazing actress and an amazing character. But I guess Tywin was right. You're not as smart as you think you are. Then again, Tywin Lannister is right about fucking everything. <laughs> Though I do have to say that it's a crying fucking shame that Cersei never got to meet up with Sansa again after everything they've been through. There is no recognition of growth or history, no empathy for their situations or hatred for causing each other so much grief. What a fucking scene that could have been. And that brings us to the characters that were obliterated. Tyrion Lannister identified almost entirely by his intelligence, has been stripped of any critical thinking one could imagine while lacking any cunning, courage, or self-worth. Why does he think that Sansa told him the truth for the sole reason that he is trusted by her? Especially when she explicitly states that Danny might not be the right ruler in the same fucking breath, and he's aware that they hate each other. Is Tyrion a stupid fuck? He also knows that Sansa wants a free north, even Jorah knew that this created enormous amounts of tension. Not to mention that he should be fully aware that she is an opportunist and that she wanted him to spread this secret, and so what does he do? He spreads it. And to be specific, he spreads it to Varys. Why? What do you expect Varys to do with this information if not decide to betray the current queen? Why did you tell him if you think this information is irrelevant and no one should do anything about it? Are you a stupid fuck? How is it that Sansa Stark managed to outsmart Tyrion fucking Lannister? It's almost as if the show wants us to think that Sansa used the fucking Kirby Swallow to steal and combine the abilities of Cersei, Tyrion, Littlefinger, and Ramsay to now be the smartest person in the fucking world. That is not how it works. These people aren't clever because they stood next to and absorbed smartness from other people. Cersei didn't learn shit from Tywin. And besides, Sansa can't be all that mastermindish if she was so overt in making a fucking enemy out of the woman who can obliterate Winterfell in seconds in the first place. Sansa makes herself an obvious opponent within moments of meeting Danny, and again when Danny presents an olive branch. <sighs> Look, the fact is that Tyrion read every book in the fucking solar system. You don't get to be smarter than him just because you stood next to better characters until you decided to wear this weird-ass armor, act smug all the time, and sport a dumbass sonic ring on a chain. What the fuck is this supposed to be? You wear it all the goddamn time and the ring never moves, stupid fucking- <sighs> The writers provide you with every unearned break you'll ever need in season 7 and 8, and all you have to do for it is happen to stand around like a fucking diuretic giraffe. Regardless, you are one of the people who outsmarted Tyrion, ruining his presence even more. Not that his character isn't falling apart anyway, he betrayed one of his apparent best friends and has them sentenced to death for a crime of something? I guess it was treason, even though Tyrion then commits several acts of treason in order to get what he wants several times. And that happens a couple of scenes later? So of course he can be justified in his actions, but Varys can't. Does he just hate Varys all of a sudden? I think that Tyrion is saying goodbye to 
his best friend in the world. <laughs> he doesn't even give Danny a small plea for Varus's life. He is portrayed as spineless, confused, and desperate, despite being in a better position of power than ever before. He doesn't even have Cersei trying to delay him or Joffrey trying to kill him, and yet he's worthless. Why are you a stupid fuck? Clearly, season two Tyrion was peak Tyrion, and we will never see his like again. But pushing on with his brain being dried up, he knows a secret entrance into King's Landing and a direct pathway to Cersei fucking Lannister. And yet he fails to mention this to anyone prior to the night before the assault, despite his faction having access to the greatest fucking assassin in Westeros. She killed Satan. How does something like this not cross Tyrion's mind when his goal is to save as many lives as possible? You could smuggle a whole selection of Unsullied through that secret entrance. Do you remember how they had ideas like that before Tyrion even joined them? Why did Tyrion decide to walk into an active combat zone against men on the opposing team who are still alive? You are an extremely distinctive, well-dressed dwarf wearing the hand's pin walking through the gates of a city being sacked. Are you is am stupid fuck? Speaking of which, it's getting fucking lame that Tyrion keeps having these strolls through burned corpses with his judgmental face. Like, I understand doing it after the fact when we find out the men have surrendered, but prior to that, did he forget that he did the exact same thing? Did he forget that he used wildfire in the Battle of Blackwater and as a result, hideously burned thousands of men? And yet, he references the battle with pride in many of the later seasons. You could storm King's Landing tomorrow and the city would fall. Hell, we almost took it and we didn't even have dragons. Almost. Kind of forgot. Look, whenever you talk, it helps nothing. Stop. The point is that they turned one of the most intelligent and consistent men of Westeros into a slow, bumbling, cowardly, backstabbing, manipulable, sobbing rat. And it's not this season that is solely to blame, but it is the one that sent his character to the grave. Which brings us, lovingly, to Jon fucking Snow. Admittedly, this won't take long because it's about a specific part of Jon's character that has been removed surgically. Jon Snow in the entire show has been quite principled, the idea being that he was directly raised by Ned Stark himself, so he would die for his convictions, and throughout the seasons we have seen that resolve get tested. Jon has committed to many expeditions that essentially present him a choice between saving innocent lives or protecting himself from danger, and he will always choose the innocent. Jon became a fan favourite due to his courage when facing down enemies that he chose to fight in order to make the world a better place for everyone, and once the world around him noticed, he started being elected into positions of power, and he was impressive. There's no need for a battle. Thousands of men don't need to die. Let's end this the old way. You against me. I don't know if I'd beat you, but I know that my army will beat yours. You have the numbers. Will your men want to fight for you when they hear you wouldn't fight for them? The outer gate won't hold. Take five men. Hold the inner gate. Okay. Hold the gate. I will not go meekly off to freeze and die. Give it to one of the fools who cast a stone for you. Did you hear me, boy? I will not have it! Are you refusing to obey my order? You can stick your order up your bastard ass. Take Lord Janice outside. Ollie, bring me my sword. I was wrong. You're the Lord Commander. We all serve you. I'm sorry. Not only for this, for all I've done and said. These are all moments in the face of denial, disrespect, and certain defeat that he will lead. And he pulled through, leading him to clash directly with the Mother of Dragons, the would-be queen who wanted the world to kneel. He showed no lack of self-respect. 
pledge your sword to her cause. And why would I do that? I mean no offense, your grace, but I don't know you. Your claim to the throne rests entirely on your father's name, and my own father fought to overthrow the Mad King. The Lords of the North place their trust in me to lead them, and I will continue to do so as well as I can. I haven't given you permission to leave. With respect, Your Grace, I don't need your permission. I am a king. But then the showrunners decided that we needed to end this story well ahead of time, and so, after one of, if not the stupidest plot lines in the history of Game of Thrones was wrapped up, Jon bent the knee and became a new character, one with very few dialogue options and the agency of a haunted jelly baby. This is a colossal shame because he was a character that thousands of people in Westeros and millions of people in real life rallied behind. He is supposed to be a leader, but his conviction is gone. He's become a worthless fucking lackey. I don't want it. I never have. I don't want it. And that's what I told him. She is our queen. And you will always be my queen. She is my queen. I love you. That selection of clips is all from one fucking episode. John's dialogue options have been truncated down into two simple choices, submit or whine. And when the queen that he so dutifully serves tells him she will rule with fear and the plan to obliterate the city is put into action, he just stands there, letting everyone suffer. And what does it take for him to wake up? Not the execution of surrendered soldiers, not the slitting of crying city folk's throats, not the screams of children, not even an attempted rape brings him out of his character assassinated stupor. The assault continues and he is woken up by the idea that his men might be injured during their pillaging. This is the guy who ferried the free folk past the fucking Night's Watch. This man is a paragon of virtue and sacrifice. He makes the lives of innocents better at any cost to his own, no matter their fucking flag. And we see him stand there, confused at the sight of pain, suffering, rape, and destruction of a surrendered set of thousands, until the majority of them are either butchered or incinerated. Go fuck yourself, Jake Snow. I actually hope that in your day-to-day -day life, your socks stay wet. That's how much I hate you. Though I suppose that goes for most of the characters at this point, which means we're moving on to Varys. Lord Varys was such an awesome character, a man who was always in the shadows, moving the pieces on the board in order to reach a conclusion that gave the lowest of all people in the realm a fighting chance at something wonderful in the world. And that goal mirrored his own journey from abused pauper to powerful puppeteer. He achieved it all through a network of informers and careful messages to the right people at the right time without his enemies retaining a single clue as to his involvement in any of these events. And once he returned to Westeros, I can't think of a single thing that Varys accomplished, other than getting more allies to Danny that get a nice violated in one episode each. The rest of his time is spent openly complaining about the state of affairs rather than doing something about it behind the scenes. And then this episode arrives and stole from him his greatest attribute espionage. Why would Varys casually announce Jon's parentage on a beach in and among a bunch of randies with Tyrion staring right at him? He implicates himself to so many people and he barely knows them or how they would react, especially Jon, which raises the issue that Varys shouldn't be this vehement about Jon's leadership in the first place. What makes him think he will be a great king when he's only proven himself a great warrior? Isn't that specific factor the premise of Robert Baratheon the warrior? king, the same king that Varys helped get rid of due to his incompetence leading to the realm's suffering? How does Varys, after all of these fuck-ups, allow himself to be captured and killed when he's aware of that eventuality and his death will have no relevance to future events? He cannot be a martyr. Remember, north or south, they sing no songs for spiders. Besides, I don't remember stories of him falling on a grenade to stop the Mad King, and Ares made it known that he intended to kill everyone in King's Land. Ending. With Danny, that was murky at best. It just doesn't make sense. He always stays out of trouble, away from the
the potential dangers and has everyone and anyone do the dirty work at his behest. And yet, he doesn't heed blatant warnings for his safety, nor his little bird's safety, despite having a heart that goes out for the people, specifically. He is an incredibly useful character, and he has a wealth of knowledge, and he lost everything in order to be killed because Melisandre said so last season. It didn't matter if it made sense. And now his legacy becomes that of, oh, he was right after all. And that's the thing. Varys has an incredible track record in keeping himself alive. That's his entire thing. He constantly pushes pieces on the board, but never so hard or fast that it can kill him, because he will otherwise never be able to push another piece again. And yet he's doing stupid shit like choosing this moment to kill Danny when it's quite possibly the worst timing ever, unless he wants Cersei to rule Westeros. What was said to Varys in the flames? What was his connection to the Lord of Light? What was his purpose in this show? Why was he so on board with promising the Tyrells and the Dornish fire and blood only to be utterly repellent at the mere ideas of burning and killing in order to achieve victories? In the end, Varys was a worthless character, a spymaster who operates in broad daylight, hardly pushing one piece on the board at a time to reach a conclusion that might bring Westeros even more pain than before. His goal fought everything we knew about him and he tried to achieve it while ignoring every sign of danger, exposure, or failure. In the end, he had no self-preservation, no intelligence, and no consistent sense of morality. He couldn't argue for his life in his final moments. He couldn't even go out damning Daenerys with an ominous line about the fear and terror she has wrought. Varys was fucking ruined. And so, we have two left. Jamie Lannister. What can I even say about this? Jamie's core is honor. His contention is honor to what cause. His conclusion is honor to the innocent. His love for his sister is his flaw. That is Jamie Lannister from the moment we meet him, but we see a side that doesn't provide that insight until season three, where it's made abundantly clear. Season seven was his love for Cersei and his honor to the innocent being placed in direct opposition. He chose chose the living. He nearly died for it. Watching him fight alongside the heroes of Winterfell has been described as fan service, but it's entirely within his character. And it was so satisfying that he could finally be open and honest about his interest in protecting people, instead of playing into the Kingslayer. It is only when he's brought to the brink that he reveals these elements of his character. Tell me if your precious Randy commanded you to kill your own father and stand by while thousands of men, women, and children burned alive. Would you have done it? Would you have kept your oath then? I can't accept it. Must be forged from Ned Stark's sword. You'll use it to defend Ned Stark's daughter. You swore an oath to return the Stark ghost to their mother. Lady Stark's dead. Maya's probably dead too, but there's still a chance to find Sansa and get her somewhere safe. I'll find her. For Lady Catelyn. And for you. When given back to Cersei, his newfound exposure of his more positive qualities were in conflict with the persona he had built for so long, and he tries to regain that familiar world that he's lost. And then he was tested, again and again, until he cracked and pursued what mattered to him most. But then Jamie's apparent arc is to then return to Cersei and give up the progression he gained. You have this slow building burn, giving reason and expression throughout the many emotional hardships Jamie and endures to change his perspective, only to then smash cut to a character we haven't seen since season fucking one. I would have murdered every man, woman, and child in Riverrun for Cersei. She's hateful. And so am I. He wanted to die with the one he loved because he was a hateful man? What the fuck does that mean? What are you referencing? What about your entire journey? Jamie is fully aware that not days ago Cersei tried to have him killed, and that she is an active monster who needs stopping, someone he had to abandon because of a fundamental conflict of values. And that was despite his love for her as a sister and a partner. But he's still addicted to her, apparently. It's interesting how we don't even see his 
his capture, every element of it in hindsight required him to have his brain removed from his skull, and so you naturally conclude that they temporarily removed his character to put him in a position his character would never have wanted to go to otherwise. Why does he get into a petty fight with Euron? Because Euron says he fucked the queen? Really? Do you understand that you're here to try and save Cersei? I thought you were addicted to her. Jaime isn't even aware that they're supposed to have a fight when he meets up with Euron. He thinks they can work together to save Cersei. Carl fucking Tanner would have made a better final boss for Jaime than Euron. I was only pretending to be retarded. Greyjoy. Seems like Jaime's priorities are less to do with him and more to do with the ever-changing plot requirements. And so you realize the only reason Jaime had plot armor in episode 3 was so that he could survive to fuck Brienne, leave her, and die to a bunch of falling rocks after delivering the most insulting line his character could ever deliver in a fucking episode of this mangled show. I promise to fight for the living. I intend to keep that promise. To be honest, I never really cared much for them. Innocent or otherwise. Kind of forgot. No, fuck off. You can't just forget that. In the name of the mother, I charge you to defend the innocent. The innocent, is it? The innocent that you don't even fucking care about. You fucking twat beard. Jamie Lannister has been completely regressed, butchered, sold for shock value, and sapped of what made him who he is. If you rewatch the show, just jump from when he is captured by the Starks to this episode, and everything will make sense. Because fuck, it'll make this episode much easier to understand, and even when watching episode two of this season, it'll only serve to confuse the shit out of you as to who this man is. You weren't sorry then. You were protecting your family. I'm not that person anymore. <sighs> the fuck is wrong with you two? So we're finally here. Daenerys of House Targaryen, a character that has been so far removed from herself that even general audiences found this episode to be utterly ridiculous, including Amelia Clark herself who was flawed when discovering this was Daenerys's fate. So let's first take a look at the defenses and explanations of this before tearing it to shreds. This was foreshadowed thoroughly. Even when you look back to season one when Khal Drogo gives the golden crown to Viserys and her reaction on watching her brother's head melted off. There is something kind of chilling about the way that Danny has responded to the death of her enemies. Yes, Daenerys always hated her brother, and she relished his death due to her slipping sanity. Or she let him die, and she was satisfied because he threatened and abused her both physically and mentally for her entire life. He used her to further himself. He threatened her unborn child, and he became extremely jealous of what she was finally achieving for herself. After his death, she named one of three children after him, showing that he may have been a monster, but he was family. So her reaction could absolutely be judged as sane, all things considered. Aside from that, this attitude towards old scenes would then have us question the amount of times that other characters have had interesting reactions to death. Reactions that I imagine we're simply not going to talk about, in the same way that we won't talk about the amount of times Danny has shown grief towards death. These things seem to get in the way of the whole foreshadowing thing, don't they? And so we've already highlighted a problem. How about another one? The show seems to pick and choose where death is awesome and death is horrifying. This is almost exclusively dictated by the music and the direction rather than the events at hand. For example, when you compare Blackwater Bay to the Gold Road, we have a very similar frequency of death and method of execution, yet we are shown that Blackwater Bay was a rousing success and it's looked back upon as Tyrion at his best, while the the Gold Road is considered an almost war crime by Danny, while simultaneously acting as evidence of her losing her mind. Another example could be that John executed Ollie and Thorn. It is considered just, and an example of John ruling fairly, providing justice for betraying the Night's Watch and choosing to kill their Lord Commander. Yet when Danny executes two high-born members of a house that refused to bend the knee and helped erase one of Danny's strongest allies, it is an example of her cruelty and her misunderstanding of custom. Arya slaughtering the phrase? Well, that's revenge, that's okay. Sansa feeding Ramsay to the dogs? That's just, uh, that's, that's revenge too, that's okay. Tyrion killing Tywin? Well, that, that's, that's revenge too, so that's fine. Danny executing these men? Well, that's tragic and she's horrible. And this happens with Danny's moments too, when she burned the Carls or the Sons of the Harpy, or when she engaged in crucifying the Masters. The show arbitrarily chooses when we can consider these moments 
elements are part of justice or a part of a potential foreshadowing of insanity. Look at Aya's face here. Does this look like foreshadowing for an altruistic, family-oriented adventurer? Where's the mad assassin Aya? As I said, sometimes we get heroic cheering, sometimes we get lingering shots of men slowly dying with tragic music. So what does that all mean? It means that they took older scenes that could be considered a microcosm of Danny's later attitude and they called it foreshadowing. Not only is that not how foreshadowing works, I'm not going to get into that here, it does not function smoothly because 1. They forgot the contextual justification for the events of those scenes. 2. These scenes are often similar to others and are yet portrayed to be much worse than those same others. 3. They forgot that there are several scenes that stand as counter to the notion of foreshadowed insanity. And 4. Many other characters have a similar set of scenes we can cite and yet they remain altruistic, merciful, or at the very least sane. Finally, if the difficult events she has gone through in these episodes guarantee insanity, then she should have been long gone ages ago. The woman has had a hard life. So we're throwing the idea that she's just insane and it was foreshadowed out the fucking window. Let's have a look at some of the other reasoning, shall we? I didn't be fair. The people did not love her, so she decided to rule with fear. How exactly would Danny conclude that burning thousands of women and children leads to the world fearing her and thus respecting her rule? When you erase that many people, the ones who are left will want you dead, not only for their family members being gone, but for the fact that they don't want to be erased either. Whether or not they bend the knee, it will be impossible to scrub that event from history, and you will have the sourest memory of any monarch to previously exist. Why does she consistently forget that her dad was deposed by the most loyal of his men because he threatened to do what she actually did to a ridiculous degree? I know what Cersei has told you, that I've come to destroy your cities, burn down your homes, murder you and orphan your children. That's Cersei Lannister, not me. I'm not here to murder. So that was a fucking lie. She told these people that Cersei was wrong, or rather that Cersei was lying. So congratulations on proving her right. I'm actually confused that taking out every single scorpion with pinpoint precision, erasing the famed Iron Fleet and the Golden Company while obliterating the Lannister armies wasn't enough fear. Do you guys remember how the threat of violence gave her more control than committing to the violence? <laughs> Right up until the Arak was swung, she had control. I suppose she learned fuck all from this. But sure, she did it to make people even more fearful of her, despite all of the obvious advice and experience she's had, making her an idiot. Fantastic. It's in that moment on, on the walls of King's Landing where she's looking at that symbol of everything that was taken from her when she makes the decision to make this personal. Can I just say that I love that the showrunners have to explain the motivations of their fucking characters to us in third party fucking content that plays after the episode. Maybe you wouldn't need this if you wrote your characters properly and stopped forgetting everything. But it's even worse because this just confuses people. You are saying that she is so overcome by facing the tragedy of what her family lost in the form of the Red Keep that she decides to destroy everything in King's Landing, including half of the fucking throne room. She should have been overcome with triumph. She's won the seat of power back in the name of her family against all odds, but instead, no, she will burn the city to the ground, providing a gross endangerment to her own faction while destroying her own reputation in order to kill innocent children. Children. How do you expect me to believe that when she is the same person who can't stand to watch the suffering of even one innocent? So she must have gone mad. Not a great argument for a well-respected eight-year-long character, but let's check it out a bit more. Daenerys lost a large portion of her army. She lost Ser Jorah. She lost My Sunday. She lost Rhaegal. She lost a lot, that's true. So has Jon, Arya, Sansa, Tyrion, and many other characters, and yet they didn't commit to murdering fleeing civilians due to maniacal insanity. Even Cersei's choice to blow up the Sept made a lot more sense politically. Regardless, these are the kinds of 
losses that should push Daenerys towards pursuing a painful death for Cersei Lannister. She could have been consumed by her hatred for Cersei, and in her pursuit, she steps over the line. There could have been a thematic element to say that in killing Cersei, she is becoming her. Instead, we don't even know if Danny is aware that Cersei is dead, and we certainly don't know what exactly would make Danny stop her rampage. Is she really waiting to make sure she's killed enough people? <sighs> So, what else made her go crazy? Alright then. So her last straw was broken because Jon wouldn't sleep with her. They literally turned Daenerys Stormborn of House Targaryen, first of her name, the Unburnt, Queen of the Andals, and the First Men, Khaleesi of the Great Grass Sea, Breaker of Chains, and Mother of Dragons, into a fucking incel. And that drove her to murder hundreds of thousands. Okay. Many people say that the scene does not represent that whatsoever, but if John had engaged with her, made her happy, it's implied that she may have reconsidered how to rule or what action to enact, and that's very embarrassing. Danny is so much better than that. She wouldn't just give up and interpret this moment as being unable to rule with love and thus needs to kill everyone, but even if you swallow that, that means we're supposed to believe that Danny essentially lost her mind over the course of two episodes and it was spurred on by John refusing to put his peony in her virginie. The fact is that people still love Daenerys and she's more than aware of that. There are still armies that love her. This is just pathetic treatment of characters we've come to know for a near decade. The idea that she simply went mad is not only disrespectful to who she is, but it undermines everything that built to this moment. Not to mention that the show has already completed a storyline like this with Cersei and it was done extremely well by comparison. The idea of making an utterly reprehensible, insane decision that as far as the character can tell is the only thing left to do and yet seems crazy from anyone viewing it from the outside. And we saw her get there after spending her days being a pawn to other powerful rulers. Once they are gone, she was free to prove herself and her arrogance cost her everything she had left. After recovering and engaging in one of the most destructive events to ever face Westeros and her last child is dead, she had completed her journey into madness. There is no action too unloving or unreasonable. She even sells her own body to gain power and control as her father once did to her, against her will. All that was left for Cersei Lannister was power. Power. Daenerys, on the other hand, was no less altruistic than Jon Snow an episode ago, and she's been given an enormous history of choices and characteristics, only for some fans of the show to happily nod their heads to the idea that we should forget it all because she was a Targaryen, and they just go mad sometimes. Danny still had so much of what she had built as well as a thankful kingdom. Cersei had nothing but a fucking zombie left, and somehow she was less insane in her story as a whole. My enemies are in the Red Keep. Then how the fuck do you explain this? On the topic of insanity, why the hell did they name this episode The Bells if they don't want people thinking The Bells made Danny go crazy? What the fuck was that about? It's like she would have accepted the surrender as long as they didn't make any noises or some shit. So yeah, screw these weak source defenses. They are built to hold the dam of criticism, but there's leaks springing all over, and it's time to explain why this came crashing down. In the time between episodes, they gave Danny this makeup to try and give us the sense of starvation and and madness on top of her losses, lulling the audience into the mindset. As the episode progresses, she then engages in some weird logic. Apparently freeing future generations from a tyrant will be the goal, and it's totally worth killing hundreds of thousands of people for, deleting many of those future generations in the act, scarring the lands for generations to come. Because Daenerys is a smart girl. Why not just demand a good old bend of the knee from these people and rule justly? Instead of of, you know, sowing resentment and pain. She even threatens to kill Tyrion, the only one who remains loyal, which is another interesting choice. Makes you wonder why she keeps him around at all. Then, jumping forward, she basically obliterates everything with dragonfire, and that kind of fucks up the moment that she locked up her dragons, because if their breath can delete stone and iron, then how can you lock them up with stone and iron? Either way, let's go over her plan. What you are now seeing is an artist rendition of King's Landing, 
complete with a fucking desert and a big sad face to represent the destroyed sept. And hey, let's pop the Golden Company out there too. So here is Danny. She's destroyed the Iron Fleet. There they are. She's taken all of the Scorpions out and the surrender has been signaled. Okay, so let's do this one at a time. What did Daenerys want to do? Well, she wanted to run right over to the Red Keep and incinerate Cersei, though she's feeling particularly angry, so let's say she does that and there's some collateral. She gets there and oh no! A few of the streams of fire have now hit civilians and anyone inside has been burned beyond belief. How horrible. But at least the fight is now over. Next up is what she could have done. She could have made her way to the Red Keep and burned a straight line to it. She could have ignited some civilians and some soldiers until the big finish. Cruel, but not too far out of what to expect. Then we move on to what she can't do, and that would be zigzagging her way there, heading to the Red Keep but making sure to blow a lot of shit up along the way, ultimately slowing herself down a bit too much. It would have been nonsensical to many of us and we'd be scratching our heads as to why she is hunting down people. And so that leaves us with the last version, what she actually did do. And uh, what was that? Well... Yeah, but to more accurately represent it, she basically makes the rounds on every element of King's Landing that isn't a direct hit on her own men, though she does absolutely deal damage to them in the form of ashes being inhaled, if not directly killing them. The funny part is that she essentially employs the lawnmower technique for about half of it, then hits the Red Keep, then lawnmowers the rest, and then finishes the Red Keep, only to seemingly hunt down Aya or some shit. This strategy is actually genuinely, astronomically, legitimately, really, photonomically, technically, theoretically, scientifically, professionally, significantly, and psychotically fucking deranged. This is the kind of thing that Ramsey Bolton wouldn't even do because he would run out of people to fucking torture. If you don't understand what I'm trying to say, then let me make it clear. This is out of character for any fucking person in Westeros. And what's worse is we we don't even see Danny throughout the destruction. We don't see how she felt while committing this atrocity. And so we've been over what happened. So now let's look at why it's poorly written. Daenerys of House Targaryen is absolutely a ruthless queen. She is capable of selfless love and cruel punishment that can breach into moral grey zones. But for every dark moment in her life, she has plenty of pleasant ones, moments of kindness and generosity. There's a reason why so many people love her character. It's almost like she's a human being, capable of a variety of feelings and impulses. She makes recognizable decisions for reasons that make sense with who she's built herself to be, and others that are driven much more emotionally. So when she's compared with Arya, I will bake your son into a pie and feed him to you, Stark, or Sansa, I will watch as your hounds devour your face, Stark, or Jon, I will hang a child that was manipulated into action he didn't understand, Snow, she's downright normal. Daenerys slots quite nicely into this world of complicated morality. But there are a few fundamental lines to consider here. Danny does not punish the slaves because of the masters. She does not kill innocent people. She always shows remorse for any innocent collateral damage, and she is not here to become Queen of the Ashes. I am not here to be Queen of the Ashes. Our fathers were evil men, all of us here. They left the world worse than they found it. We're not going to do that. We're going to leave the world better than we found it. I don't want another child's bones dropped at my feet. Well, gosh, these statements aged like a fine urine sample, didn't they? Daenerys has been interested in domination since her inception. This was likely spurred on by stories from her brother, not to mention her heritage and her name, but it was tempered by many other elements of her character and her experiences, and that's what made her special, to enter the game knowing what happened to the past players. In addition, she had a team of advisors that saw the many crimes administered to the people of the country, and they had a desire to do better. With with one key aspect being that she would liberate slaves due to essentially starting life as one. And the request of San Ahariashek, Majin Morinembes, Majin Nembos Osaji. Jinia Pella Jalar, Jinchura says Zafrajin, Majin Kisha Takimora, then Maya Balaya Pakisha. And then I'm Alia Fakvanza Digmora. Hash Totra Kisha Kitsi Sajimora, Hash Morikit Mamoa Mamora. 
When the wise masters of Yunkai offered Danny gold and ships to invade Westeros, she refused because she wanted to liberate the slaves. She wanted to save innocent people. Prior to that, when she was able to leave, her only concern was asking how many slaves were in the city. On top of that, when faced with one repercussion of Drogon's fury, she recoiled and punished her other children because of the awful circumstances. These moments make up what is the driving force behind her character. They reveal the core values beneath her every action. She has a gentle heart, right? You have something more than that. You may cover it up and deny it, but you have a gentle heart. You have a gentle heart. Look, I don't particularly like Daenerys. I never did. I found that many of her victories were won by other people or other resources she obtained through easy means, and her arrogance can make her incredibly frustrating to watch during discussions. She is, however, a strong character, with major amounts of history that inform her every move. And the explicit reason she didn't assault King's Landing up to this point was to avoid killing civilians, especially children. <laughs> You must win it. That will mean blood on your hands before the thing is done. The blood of my enemies, not the blood of innocents. She will not spill the blood of the innocent nor of children. And yet we get a moment in this episode where Daenerys may as well have specifically targeted an innocent crying child trying to help its wounded mother from the ground after being cut down by a Dothraki rider. And despite all of that, Daenerys chooses to cremate them both herself. What the fuck? I kind of said we weren't going to talk about it, but... Let's talk about it. Foreshadowing is often meant to be an indication of future events from a similar yet less significant one in the past. Foreshadowing is not reasoning for a future event to occur, neither is it development. The reasoning for actions that cause important events get relegated to discussions on character, of what makes them who they are and why they chose what they did. If you find yourself using a small piece of foreshadowing to justify the biggest event in your story, then you have likely become a hack writer that is desperate to create create a payoff that you want, but simply cannot have. Not that foreshadowing was even relevant to this story, since Daenerys was never in a scenario where she was happy to kill children for no reason. It's simply a buzzword being tossed around in defense of terrible writing. So this entire thing is fucked regardless. Daenerys Targaryen has become the most hideous monster to ever haunt Westeros. Varys was completely justified, Cersei was completely justified, Robert Baratheon was completely justified. Attack! Targaryen at the head of a Dothraki army. What then? She dies. This fucking wine merchant is the unsung martyr of Westeros. The audience has been completely betrayed, and her character will forever be remembered as a stupid, maniacal, mass-murdering, quasi-Satan muppet, motivated by her lack of options to get laid. Not only is that insulting to the audience, it's insulting to all of the people who worked so hard to bring her to the screen. I don't think she decided ahead of time that she was going to do what she did. You don't think? Aren't you the one who writes these characters, you quantum retard? Danny has been swapped out for another character. It's a plain and simple assassination, and as much as Luke Skywalker held the title previously, Daenerys Targaryen is the most horrific example of a character assassination that I have ever seen in media. It is a literal U-turn. A woman who fought for the release and protection of the innocent that ends up burning hundreds of thousands of them with no fuck remorse for no fucking reason. A complete contradiction, and they are welcome to be proud of winning that award. Wait, what? They submitted the finale for a writing Emmy? Are you fucking kidding me? Is Clown World actually real? Bobby B was fucking right. Your mother was a dumb whore with a fat ass. did you know that? Oh, I meant about Danny, but I love how this whole show has just proven that he should have stayed on the Iron Throne. What a fucking waste of time. Though I did think it was interesting that the opening of this episode had the montage to remind us of any lines during the show that could have foreshadowed Danny's descent into madness. Not the montage itself or the content of the quotes, just the method of writing. It's like the slimiest way to try and force an outcome that you want but can't have. You can do this for any character. Let's assume Aya goes crazy and at the beginning of the 
episode, we had this. A Stark alone can be a terrible thing. Children are not their fathers. She does not want power or money. She wants blood. The North remembers. Be a wolf. She will be the end of us all. She's killed children. She will never stop. Not if they lose their heads first. Okay, that was easy. Let's try John. The Mad King gave his enemies the justice he thought they deserved. This is a dangerous game you are playing. Be a dragon. Every time a Targaryen is born, the gods flip a coin. Targaryen, alone in the world. It's a terrible thing. You don't want to wake the dragon be. A great warrior can make for a mad fool. Children are not their fathers. My father told me big men fall just as quick as little ones. If you put a sword through their hearts. So, you can kind of see where I'm going with this, right? Let's try one more. The man who will cook the world into oblivion. Each time a meal is made, the gods flip a coin, and he may poison that meal. Children are not their fathers. Be a cook. He is more pie than man. This creature will have us all on our knees in his kitchen. Even the White Walkers fear what comes from his oven. There's nothing in life he wants more than our suffering. He will not provide it, but you can pray for a quick death from the the hot pie. I knocked him down and I kicked him in the balls and I kept kicking him until he was dead. Like I said, it's bullshit, and they should be ashamed of how little work they've put into writing this when millions of people would have killed for the chance to take any of these characters further on their respective journeys. Daenerys Targaryen was fucking obliterated. And so, that leaves us with something of a conclusion. Season 8, Episode 5 of Game of Thrones was a disaster. It's undeniably the worst episode in the show. The world building is mostly a continuation of how broken it already was from previous episodes. And yet, it is depressing just how tiny this incredible world has become. There are no reasonable consequences for any actions any longer. In fact, the world services the characters, it doesn't exist on its own merits. I now assume that whenever all of the protagonists are about a mile away from any area, it simply turns black and white and goes on pause. Conversations are cut short when important, and they are elongated when playing up a joke or filling time. They have taken what should have been incredible payoffs and replaced them with confusing ones. This while providing payoffs that are completely unearned and nailing the ones we've already ruined through hyping them beyond what the source even has as meaningful content to support it. Despite how simple the episode is, the plot was still utterly ridiculous. Every character seems to commit to actions or pathways that are the most difficult or useless, especially while other ones are present. It shows the blatant cracks in the resources of the world and the agency being completely sapped from so many threads in the plot. But the biggest element that was mishandled to a previously unseen degree was absolutely the characters. Almost all of them either lost their development since the show began, or they betrayed themselves to such a degree that they make Ryan Johnson look semi-competent. These were beloved characters of eight years in the making, and you ripped them all to shreds in order to get the job done quickly. Your apathy has never been more obvious, and as a result you tore apart what people connected to for a decade. It doesn't actually matter if you two no longer give a single shit about this silly, magical zombie and dragon show. It doesn't matter if you think you had better things to do. Millions of other people were waiting for a meaningful conclusion to their investment. They held their breath for these final episodes. So much inspiration, so much love turned to ash. There is no fucking excuse for this kind of incompetency. Storytelling has been a core part of the human experience since its inception. Through stories, we can teach the young and impressionable. We can caution the naive. We can inform the ignorant. Or we can find meaning in the lives we live by watching how these people do the same thing. As they face fictional hardships and heartaches, we can learn how to face them for real. Shitty fucking writing is ruining all of that. Shitty fucking writing is damaging the majority of franchises that were once pillars of a generation of media. Shitty fucking writing is getting more and more common the more we say it doesn't exist. The more that we say that consistency in character, plot, plot, world, and theme is entirely a preference, the more you can expect stories like The Last Jedi, X-Men Dark Phoenix, Terminator Genesis, The Predator, Alien Covenant, Ghostbusters 2016, Captain Marvel, and Game of Thrones Season Fucking 8. <sighs> there is no skill, only feels. Words that will kill writing as a craft. 
But not to worry, these days there are still plenty of people who are willing to point out this cinematic rectal fluid down to the smallest details. One day it will perhaps provide a sort of resurgence in the kind of incredible writing that can blow this quagmire of horse shit away into a distant embarrassing memory. We can, of course, only hope. Regardless, that brings us to the end. This video took a long, bloody time to make. If you want to see more videos like this from my channel, then please consider supporting my Patreon. If you don't want to use Patreon but still want to support the channel, I run a Subscribestar page as well. There is a link in the description, and through services like that I can continue to work on this channel full time. And I can't wait to talk about all kinds of media going forward. I would also like to highlight that two portions of animation in this video were created by an excellent channel known as Cynic Snacks. If you could go ahead and check his channel out, you will find yourself subscribing very soon after. He makes wonderful work tackling terrible media in an extremely unique and entertaining way. His channel is very much underappreciated, so let's try and fix that to a degree shall we? A link to his channel is in the description. Now, my coverage of episode 6 of this season will arrive one day, but I am currently unsure of exactly which project I will be committing to next, so I guess I will simply see you next time, whenever that may be and for whatever project that may be. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you folks next time. Emilia Clarke wandered around London for three hours aimlessly after she got hold of the scripts for season 8 and found out what happened to Daenerys Targaryen, according to the Press Association. We don't know for sure, but it's a fair punt that Clarke padded sadly around Dragon Road in Camberwell for a final pilgrimage. It might as well have been raining and I would have just walked in it not knowing what to do, Clarke said, adding that there were loads of tears while she filmed her final scenes as Daenerys. That was the moment I realised that alcohol could also be a depressant, Clark said. I was kind of nursing a glass of wine going, I don't know why I'm not getting any happier from this. Clark revealed to Vanity Fair that she's already filmed her final Game of Thrones scene. It fucked me up, she said of her last moment on the show, in no way revealing whether she makes it all the way to the season 8 finale or not. Knowing that this is going to be the lasting flavour in someone's mouth of what Daenerys is? And with that she trailed off, unable to say anything more. I meant what I said. I wouldn't say she's acting like the Mad King because it's rational. She's giving them a choice and they choose not to bend the knee to her and she accepts that choice and she does exactly what she told them she'd do. She's not her father and she's not insane and she's not a sadist, but there's a Targaryen ruthlessness that comes with even the good Targaryens. <laughs> Tyrion then tells the Unsullied that a guarding Lamy Janet. Lamy Janist. <laughs> Not to mention that we're very unclear about her values on life at this point, and... Well... That'd be ice cream.